one of the biggest problems that we've encountered, and maybe you guys can agree or disagree with me, that I think in fitness is that before it used to be that there wasn't a lot of information. Uh, now it seems like there's, there's too much. Well, there's just a lot of convoluted. Yeah, information, but most of it's not accurate. Most of it's not helpful. Like mm-hmm. they're gonna push uh, a study that's gonna promote them selling their supplement, or they're gonna promote, a, you know, a diet that's gonna help sell their, you know, book or their, you know, a lot of bias. A lot of bias. A lot of falsities. A lot of it based on advertising. So mm-hmm. it's like, hey. You know, lose this much weight in sixty days, or and so people are getting shred. I can't believe, and I, I take it for granted because we've been in the industry as long as we have. We've been as professionals, and this is what we love to do. And I take for granted just how confusing it is because we know how to sift through. We know what's right and what's wrong. Mm-hmm. And I get, you know, I was we get qu- questions all the time from from uh, fans, and you think to yourself, like, well, you should know the answer to that, but they don't. Mm-hmm. Like well, these are questions that we take for granted. Well, this is a lot of what inspired the thirty the thirty days of coaching for us is you know how do we take all this information? Even think about all the information that we've put out there over the last two years. We have like almost five hundred fucking episodes. Mm-hmm. So how do we take five hundred episodes? That's daunting for just anybody to yeah, just jump into. And, and most people that are just now coming on board to mind public. Like, let's be honest, the time that it takes to actually go back and listen, all a lot of people aren't going to be able to do that. So how did we, how do we curate all this information? And, and make it very, very valuable to somebody who's just now onboarding or maybe started just a little while back with us. And I think that's what inspired the 30 yeah. day of coaching is how would we take somebody who we just met and try and break down all this information mm-hmm. that just we tried. Just one to- topic at a time. One day, one focus, one topic. Let's just break down that one thing so you can understand it on a deeper level. Our goal with the 30 days of coaching was uh, when someone goes through the all 30 days, at the end of it, they should be much better off and much more well informed with fitness and nutrition and how to apply it to themselves. Not just information, because you can get lots of information. Like you can Google protein and learn about it, or Google carbohydrate or mobility or meditation or whatever and read about it. But that's part of it. The other part of it is how does it apply? How can I apply it to myself? Is this something that I can incorporate into my life? And how would I? based on my current level of fitness, where I'm at, you know, mentally where I'm at with all the stuff. And so what we've done is we've sequenced it out over 30 days. So every day you get a new topic. Some of them are very basic, like proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Others are much more, you know, relationship to food and meditation and things that have to do with wellness and gut health. And what we do is we send you an email with bullet points of information that we think are important to know on it. But then what we do is we also send you links to episodes where we discuss those topics in detail. And not only that, but we tell you the time in the episode. So if you get an hour long, you know, let's say it's episode 275 and, you know, and that one we cover, uh, you know, uh, undulating calories, for example. Well, you don't have to listen to the whole episode. We'll tell you at minute, you know, 1535 or, you know, 15 minutes and 35 seconds, this is when we start that. And then you could start right there and listen to as much as you need. Well, we're breaking it down and explaining it to you. So again, at the end of this 30 days, you should be much more informed. And and really the goal for us is to be able to provide this information to build our value. We really want to give back to our fans, but also build our value because we know we have great information. There's already so so much that we've already recorded and put out there and the people having trouble sifting through it. Well, we're showing you what we what we would give someone, especially someone just getting started or somebody who's kind of confused. This is how we would organize it, and it's free. We're not going to charge you a dime for it, and we're constantly updating it. We're trying to make it better and better. All you got to do is you go to mindpumpmedia.com. It's the first thing that pops up, and just opt in, and every day you'll get an email with those links to episodes and YouTube videos, and we're going to be adding study links to this if you want to get deeper and read actual studies that support some of the stuff that we talk about. It's uh, awesome information. It's absolutely free. There's no nothing for it. Again, we're just trying to build value and what we do. Um, and it's also a great way to share if you're already feel good on your journey. If you've knew this for a while, like it's a great way to share to someone who is just getting started. You can say, Hey, look, opt in for this 30 days of coaching. You'll get all the information that you need to get you going to really get you started. And it's all organized out for them. 
Um, and again, absolutely free. Yeah, my favorite part about it is Doug has also created a glossary at the end of it. So once you complete the 30 days, there is a, a glossary that has all the links to each specific topic. So you have a nice place that you can, and I always recommend that people save that somewhere or flag it in your email. So if you want to go back and reference protein, you forgot what, you know, fat does in the body or you had, you know, questions about strength training. I mean, there's a, it's a great place to reference all this or share these references with other people. So awesome, excellent tool. We're getting tons of great feedback. We've literally only been doing it for about 45 days or so. So we've only had, you know, probably about a thousand or 2000 people go through it. And what we're getting as far as feedback has been phenomenal. So urge you guys to get on to mindpumpmedia.com, uh, sign up on the pop-up as soon as it pops up, and then yeah. the email will start to drip to you. The very Share it to, with your friends and your family and just kind of spread the word. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. That's Remember wolf. Cookie Crisp? Yeah, yeah. Cookie Crisp. It's a cereal made up of cookies. mini cookies. Yeah, a small cookies. Yeah. <laughs> what if? Like, you fat fuck. What if? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Oh, you like milk and cookies? Oh, yeah. yeah. Here's a cereal yeah. devoted to you, mini cookies. Yeah. Like, you know, oh, guys, I love cookies, but you know what the problem with cookies how, is? Because we know how you like that, you, you know fatty what the, fat. You, yeah, you know what the problem with cookies is? Is they're... They're kind of monster. they're kind of big, and I'd like to put more of them in my mouth yeah. at the same time. I want to be able to fit a plethora of and, cookies in my mouth. And taking a cookie and dipping it in milk require. I mean, it's like you got to take the That's time. Effort. Like, what if I just could I just want to spoon it? What in. if you like only? What if I just dump like a, a, like a shovel, shit ton of cookies wanna, in a bowl of milk and then eat them as much as I and fast? I feel as I like could. Chips Ahoy are the only cookies that you're supposed to dip in milk. And Oreos. Yeah, Oreos. Oreos and Chips Ahoy. All chocolate chip cookies. No, 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 no. Now we're getting crazy. Yeah, because like, it has to be... Chips Ahoy are like hard and crunchy, and so putting in the milk kind of softens it up. If you already have a soft cookie and you put it in the milk, then it makes it like soggy. Yeah. You don't want a soggy cookie. You I want a you. wet cookie. Yeah. You, <laughs> and you never want a, peanut butter. You want a wet and hot and hard cookie. Whoa. You don't want a wet and soggy cookie. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't really? want to sog yeah. it out. I like it. I, I like it either way. Do you drink the milk afterwards? I like. You like it hard or soft in your gross. mouth? I like. I like when the. You cookie, like it hard or soft in your mouth? Sure. I he like does. it when when pieces of the. Can cookie, you say that to me? He doesn't have preferences. <laughs> I like it when pieces of the cookie are in the milk, and then you have to like drink the milk. You drink it, but it's like chunky. Mm. You know I don't what I'm know saying? if I like that. Yeah. I just I normally throw the milk out. Oh afterwards. yeah, yeah. It's you it's, do what? It's specifically the only for, time I'll drink the milk. Like you remember? Co it's uh, only for cocoa dipping. crispies. Chocolate right? milk. Oh my god, the the, the chocolate milk. Guy. I used to actually put chocolate milk in. Oh god, in cereal. Oh my god, that's like damn it. You just like tapped into the matrix. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah even it was, all the way in. It's like dividing by zero. Like I fuck. And oh, you. Shit, and, oh my god. And we wonder. Uh, we wonder why at thirty five plus we're all fucked up now. I know, right? <laughs> Borderline diabetes. Yeah, and here right. we are. And then I wash it down with some sour patches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On my way to school, eat some gummy worms. <laughs> hey, hey, son. For breakfast, mm. here's your chocolate chocolate uh, milk put it on your cocoa krispies and then wash it down with some of this oh my god my teeth are falling some of this out. high C yeah. like super sugary not juice yeah <laughs> It's not and juice. The Kool Aid Man busts through. Yeah. Hey, good morning, man. We have had quite the, the lineup the last uh, couple weeks here, man. And I, I keep saying that, man, this was my favorite. Man, this is my favorite. It's been pretty rad to feel like each time we do an interview, the, the it one up stepping up our game. Well, raw. So I don't know if it's us or we're getting to be. No, we're just getting meeting a cooler people. Yeah, cooler right? people. Like that, we, there's the truth. Uh, we we met with Rob Wolf. Um, fucking badass. He, he's a badass. He's definitely yeah. a badass. What really perked our interest with Rob besides him having a, a popular podcast um, is he's a former research biochemist and his specialization, a lot of the stuff he studies has to do with autoimmune disease and cancer, which is always fascinating, very right? fascinating, especially the autoimmune aspect of it. And he's kind of known as like one of the leaders of the whole paleo ancestor diet, you know, eat according to the way humans have evolved uh, type um, that movement, you know what I mean? Now, the, the thing I like about Rob is when you meet with him and talk to him about he's not only, He's not only responsible for that. He is responsible for that being involved in all the CrossFits, dude. The mm -hmm. fact that that has become like the official diet. He was one of, of the first guys. Yeah, yeah. he yeah. is. He definitely he, brought he, those communities yes, together. Yes, he but, is the man. But I want to be clear, like when you talk with him, as is true with many, many times, you'll get a movement that becomes dogmatic because the followers are dogmatic. But then you meet the like the person behind it. 
and he's not. That's he's not. He's not dogmatic. What, Which he, can we be honest? Let's be honest. I think I at least I was a little nervous that that could happen. Right when we course. go to, when we go to meet these guys and we know that they have something like that that they've and we're not like we are not fans of like only this way of eating. Yeah. I thought, oh man, I want to be really bummed if this really smart guy is just. All this is the answer, and he totally was not like that. No, he he talks about how we need to look at how we evolved, uh, you know, evolution, uh, and look at that along with what we know about nutrition mm -hmm. now. Like you need to take into basically what he's saying is why don't these areas of science converge? Like they definitely yeah. influence each other. Like if you study any animal, right. You always look at what they evolved. Their environment, eating. their patterns, yeah, what they're eating, like how all these like things that they're that's in front of them is affecting them, and it's just a rational way to look at. Don't things. I found that that was probably one of the most fascinating things that he brought up, and it was like this light bulb went off on my head, like how fucking crazy is that? That if we were to do any research on any animal, that we would take into account where they where they live. Mm -hmm. How they sleep? Are they nocturnal? What their natural habitat is with their diet? Yeah. What mm -hmm. foods are they eating? What types of things do they they mm -hmm. prey on? All these. And what have they been eating? Yeah. Right. Yeah. All that would you take into account? But yet, when we study the human body, we just throw that out the door. Well, right. I, that, we, I, that, that doesn't matter. Right. How Anthro the fuck does that happen? Well, anthropo anthropologists uh, study that. Evolutionary scientists study that, but they don't study then. They don't communicate together. They don't communicate with yeah. like dietitians and nutritionists and. You know, people who work on that, that, you know, just nutrition. They don't really, there's no cross pollination there, which, you know, good and bad, right? Uh, we do a really good job of specializing in particular areas, which yeah, is but how, good in some ways, but in other ways, it's bad. I think it's, there's more bad than good because how can you specialize to me and without taking in consideration all the other systems of the body? Mm. All these systems communicate together. We know this. We know that now. And I think he gets into this really uh, well. We it's get, because we've been successful with it. We've been mm -hmm. successful with this model at curing you well, know that's, that's antibiotics. Deba that's, and deba that's debatable. Well, 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 I don't think you can debate. Western medicine has made some tremendous uh, leaps and bounds. Sure. And, and, and but the problem is now we're encountering issues that are chronic and not acute. Like we're, yeah. we we've dealt with the acute issues. It's the chronic issues it's now. It's the lingering problems that have now started to really pop up. Yeah, yeah. and we don't have uh, the way we've designed our, our system is based on how we've dealt with acute issues, not how we deal with these chronic issues. And all he's saying is we need to take this into account, and he talks about this quite a bit. We watched a video, a YouTube video, which I highly recommend anybody yeah. watch. The it's amazing of, it doesn't have more views. It should have millions of views. The, ti the title of it is it's Rob Wolf, Darwinian Medicine. But he kind of breaks it down and explains it, and uh, there are some examples he gives of some of these cultures where they eat high carbohydrate and high fat, I and high fat, and how we'll they, put it, like we'll they put break the, all the rules, yet they're super healthy. Like, right. how is that possible? We'll put the link in the show notes. So we not, should. Uh, yeah. Those that don't know already, too, we've just recently started that. So I know we talk a lot about. Um, you know, either you know, something that one of us has used as far as products or books that one of us have read or people that we're interviewing share this type of information. Uh, now you guys can go to our website and you guys can find all the show notes uh, for all these episodes going forward and there'll be direct links to any of those things if those as far as the books. So you okay. go mindpumpmedia.com podcast and then you'll get all the show notes right there. Um, but yeah, Rob Wolf wrote uh, bestseller, uh, The Paleo Solution. Mm -hmm. It's like one of the Bibles of that particular <laughs> movement. Um, he has another book that just came out uh, rather recently called Wired to Eat. We'll have links to those on the on the show notes as well. He's got a podcast which is very informative. Uh, you mm -hmm. learn quite a bit. And again, he is not nearly as dogmatic as the paleo quote unquote movement can be sometimes, especially when you look at these some of these people who don't really understand it. Um, but his podcast is called the Paleo Solution Podcast. Then his website is robwolf.com. Rob spelled with two Bs yep. uh, at the end. Double but, B. Yep. So here we are talking to Rob Wolf. Enjoy. Rob, I want you to, to talk about your background again now that we're on because you had just said your background in research and let's go over that for a second. Oh man, it won't be as good as what it was before we recorded, but I, I, <laughs> way in the deep dark history, I was a research biochemist mainly looking at autoimmunity and cancer issues and had a lot of health problems personally and that's kind of what drove me towards this investigation into the paleo diet, ancestral health, evolutionary medicine. Very interesting. Now, uh, I have two questions for you on that. Uh, number one, what were your some of the health issues, if you don't mind uh, going into? And second, we've talked about this on the show and it, it, it it's not being advertised 
like the like we've had the obesity epidemic that people are talking about or the cardiovascular disease, disease epidemic. But there is a massive autoimmune disease epidemic that seems to be like nobody's really talking about. Right. It, what's going on with that? Well, um, we don't really know. Like we definitely, you know, there's some interesting trends. So we start seeing these upticks in obesity and then upticks in neurodegenerative disease, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, and then also autoimmunity has been on an uptick. And we have some changes in our photo period. We have significant changes, it appears, in our gut microbiome and the, you know, potential permeability at the gut interface. There's some great research suggesting that the gut microbiome has an input in everything from cardiovascular disease to neurodegenerative disease. Like there's a, a thought that specific bacterial strains may be inducing Parkinson's and Alzheimer's in some people. So I don't think anybody really knows exactly what's going on, but there's definitely a big autoimmune component to the whole story. Even just the process of atherosclerosis and like, a you know, developing a heart attack. Historically, we've just looked at like protein, carbs, fat, and then we got a little more sophisticated and talked about inflammation, maybe some insulin. But now the really cutting edge lipidologists are looking at the atherogenic process as an autoimmune event. And so it's immune dysregulation. And when you really auger in and look at, say, like the lipoproteins, they're a critical feature, not just of energy distribution, but also they're part of the innate immune response. If and, you get an infection. And I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Like uh, people have said that the, the you know, inflammation uh, you know, of the heart, if you will, and that's not, that's super. I know that's super general, but how the plaque formation and how the body seems to pack cholesterol along the arteries is really just a response. It's like an autoimmune reaction. Like we're trying to keep things, uh, you know, right. together. And it, 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 people, I don't think people realize how because we when I say autoimmune, people will think of the common autoimmune uh, issues, but autoimmune is this umbrella that covers like. Neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, you know, bone disorders like uh, you know types of arthritis, skin disorders. I mean, uh, you know, uh, gas. You know, uh, when people are getting like heartburn, this could be something that's autoimmune. Right. Like, it's a huge umbrella of things, and we're talking about this uh, this explosion or what seems to be this this uh, this epidemic that's happening. Do we see that in non-Western societies, or do we see that as much in societies that are more like your? Hunter gatherer. Is this more of a new, as a, of a recent thing? I guess it, it's definitely a disease of civilization. Like even if you go to places like Central America, uh, Southeast Asia, you don't have to get paleo to see a protective effect against a bunch of these diseases. And you just don't see things like peanut allergies or weed allergies. I mean, and we again, we don't fully know what's going on. Um, some of the ideas are this, uh, you know, around this hygiene hypothesis where we're not getting exposed to enough bacteria and viruses and different, you know, uh, uh, immunostimulatory things in our environment. People are being born via C-section instead of vaginal birth, and that can have some implications for the, the gut microbiome and the biome we have on our, our skin. As good as antibiotics are, like a little over 100 years ago, if somebody got a routine infection, a lot of times they died from it. Now we can fix that, but there may be some knock-on, you know, uh, effects that aren't that beneficial that may actually be challenging with, you, you know, the kind of chronic exposure to antibiotics. We have lots of antibiotics in our food system. So, I mean, it's a really multifactorial problem. And, and you know, going back to antibiotics and infectious disease, the 20th century was really about dealing with infectious disease, whether it was antibiotics or, or um, vaccines or public health to kind of, you know, quarantine that stuff and mitigate it. Now, the 21st century is going to be about degenerative disease, but that, that um, one disease, one pathology kind of mindset and a magic bullet in the form of a vaccine or an antibiotic is not going to work for degenerative disease. And what we see now is a matrix-driven disease process. It's not A goes to B goes to C. It may be that there are 20 different things that may or may not flip somebody into a disease state, like developing rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis. We know that like north-south uh, latitude gradients can increase the likelihood of autoimmunity. So if you live closer to the poles, you might uh, be uh, at higher likelihood of developing autoimmune disease that may be related to vitamin D. It may be related to the other secosteroids that are produced in response to sunlight that go into vitamin D 
But for sure, if you, you know, li again, live further away from the equator, that it increases the probability. If you get a crushing injury, it increases the probability. If you get different types of infectious agents, it increases the probability. But there's not typically any one singular thing that just causes this disease. Mm -hmm. And so if you go back to like high school biology and Koch's postulate, you know, it's like you've got a, a medium that is sterile and then you inoculate it with a, a bacteria and the bacteria grows and then you kill it and you, or you pull some of it out and grow it somewhere else. This is part of like the scientific process of establishing a, you know, causality with a disease. But when we were in this matrix story, it could be 20 different factors and factors we haven't even thought about or factors that we think may be part of it, but it's a peripheral deal, but there's something going on there. And this has uh, been something that's really confounded uh, the, the evidence-based medicine scene, which is really amazing and, and has really moved a lot of things forward. But when you get into this situation where it is almost infinitely complex, then the biggest benefit that I've seen is just someone that's thinking about mechanisms, experimenting in a clinical fashion, we, we try a protocol, we see what works, and we may not really know what's going on. And this is what makes some of the real evidence-based medicine people kind of freak out because they're like, it's pure anecdote. You can't replicate this. But, you know, there may be some of this stuff that is really, really difficult, possibly impossible so to replicate. When you get into, you know, epigenetics and talking about how many people get freaked out and how many feathers do you ruffle when you start talking about Because this is where people oh, get in this... It depends on which crowd I'm in. You know? like, so I, I was supposed to give a, a talk um, next week to one of the hospital systems here and everything was set up, everything was going to go. And then just yesterday they were like, yeah, we can't do it. And I mean, it was, it was a pretty big event. And then we found out that somebody in the dietetics staff mm -hmm. there caught wind is like, oh, the low carb paleo guy is coming in. No way. And, and the, the talk was about the neuroregulation of appetite and autoimmunity. So we weren't even like... I mean, we weren't even going into most of the places that they that they would be really concerned about for right or for wrong. But um, you know, it depends on who I'm talking to. What uh, do you think that is, though? What do you why, think yeah, that causes? Is, what, what's your opinion on what what causes people to be like that when we get into topics? Yeah, because like this? nutrition is like it's in the same category as like politics and religion. For God's sake, like yeah. you can talk about anything. You bring up religion, and everybody gets offended and, and scared and pissed off. You know, there's a book called The Moral Mind, and it, it's pretty good. It, 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 it you know, lays out this argument that from an evolutionary biology perspective, we evolved in these small group hunter-gatherers, and you needed an us versus them kind of deal. And um, I think that that's still with us today. You know? Tribalism. So, yeah, just the yeah. tribalism. And so that's a really, really hard thing to shake. There's also this thing called the uh, the horseshoe theory of, of politics, where it's like you've kind of got the libertarians and moderates at one end of the horseshoe and then you go super left and super right but interestingly the left and right end up looking really similar they're yeah. totalitarian they're inflexible they yeah i mean they they end up mirroring each other and i think that um you could probably make an argument that within a given group it's of benefit to probably have a few you know outside the box thinkers that would be libertarians and then it would be good to have some more like okay we're these are the orthodox people that are staying in these lane lines and it keeps the continuity of the society like there's probably some benefit there but this is interesting too as we get into the social media phase where people can interface in a way that's reasonably anonymous so they can be pricks to each other and any <laughs> sense of like you know it, it most of the time so like true. anonymously yeah, yeah it, you know people will say things that they in a in a physical setting where somebody could leap across the table and start beating you in the face. Like right. there's just no sense of class or, 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 you know, like reciprocity or anything. So you get this worst element of humanity and you create an environment where that can be facilitated. And then just at our fundamental level, our kind of genetic wiring, we're just kind of tribal and kind of knuckleheads. Like it's, we were, we're um, monkeys. We're monkeys, and we're really <laughs> prone to confirmation bias. And so, to circle around, even though I was maybe dinging on the evidence-based medicine a little bit, there is a reality that this is the value of science. You know, mm -hmm. this is the value of being able to replicate studies and and go deep and get validation and get statistical significance and whatnot. But you know, Max Planck observed that science moves forward one funeral at a time. You know, and there's definitely some mm -hmm. truth with that. Like you've just got to let the old guard die off and, and see what the, the new generation is going to come oh, up Oh, yeah. With. I'm sure if, uh, you know, Newton, you know, learned about quantum mechanics, he'd be, you know, vehemently opposed to the craziness of it, right? Right, right. You, you know, 
I so when it, from an autoimmune standpoint, I have a lot of experience, personal experience from it, and so I've been in that world. I have a very close family member who was uh, stricken with Crohn's disease at a, at a younger age, and um, his mother's a dietitian, so we, she was very much on that side of nutrition. And we used to debate quite a bit about nutrition, and she'd say, "No, you're wrong, Sal. The evidence shows that low fat is fine, and that carbohydrates, whole grains are great." And I debate with her, and you know, certain things, and now that her child has had this, she's re-examined and gone very, very deep. And uh, what I'm finding, and I wanted to ask your opinion on this, as I went deep into this world, I noticed across the board with autoimmune disorders, everything from Alzheimer's to Crohn's, people tend in that category where they have these outward you know, expressions of autoimmune disease, they tend to respond better to diets that restrict carbohydrates and grains in particular. Now, I know you're a big advocate for paleo, uh, paleo type diets or, you know, ancestral type diets. Why do you, why do you think that is? Why do you think it is, especially though in those categories, like if you go online and you go on the forums and this, this of course is anecdote, but we know that anecdote and observation drive science. You go on these forums, you go on the Crohn's forums, you go on the, the MS forums, you go on the forums with people dealing with, uh, people, you know, with, uh, you know, older people in their, in their households that have dementia and Alzheimer's. You will find lots of consensus that you know restricting grain intake and restricting processed foods and you know eating you know more of this you know more of these natural fats and whatever works better for these people. Why is that? Why 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 would that be? Because it's it's like these diseases aren't connected, or are they? Oh, they're super connected, and that's part of the problem. I I've been working on a blog post for literally a couple of years that it's something to the effect the death of the specialist because it's like. Now, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative disease, it's all the same. It, it, you know, the History Channel guy with the crazy hair, and he's like, aliens, you know, and I want to do the, like, it's all the oh, same. I love that. And, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, people love to get it's into terrible. silos, and that's where they kind of, and it's good on the one hand because we're getting deeper on that specific topic, but then also they, it's almost impossible to talk to a neurologist and a GI doc and be like, hey, man, you guys are dealing with the same thing. It's just, some genetic and epigenetic variabilities as to this person gets gut problems and this person gets neurological problems. And you sound like a crazy person suggesting that, but there's some pretty good data that's emerging to, to really support that. And it'll take time to flesh it out. But, you know, Dr. Terry Walls is a really interesting we example interviewed her. of this she was whole awesome. thing. Yeah. You know, and um, so she reversed her own multiple sclerosis. Uh, she did it largely with kind of a a modified ketogenic autoimmune paleo type type of approach. And she was a pariah among the multiple sclerosis society, you know, seen for years, probably four years, five years. They didn't want anybody talking about it. They didn't want her mentioned. And then over the course of time, uh, what she related to me is what at some point there was 15 times more chatter on the MS message boards about this kind of autoimmune paleo than all the other methods combined, like uh, swank and, and a, a vegan approach and what have you. And just because something's popular doesn't mean that it's right. You know, just look at reality TV and we have a pretty good example of that. I used to feel... <laughs> good analogy. I used to feel hoity-toity about being a New York Times bestselling author and then Snooki did it. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> doesn't, it doesn't fucking matter at all. Oh, you know? no. There's no relevance whatsoever. That's what we were talking about before we got right, on here. Right, it's just that right. battle, right? I mean, yeah. God. <laughs> so, you know, we still really don't know what all the mechanisms are with autoimmune disease. Or is it five mechanisms or is it 20 mechanisms, but there's clearly a gut interface. There's clearly uh, some sort of molecular mimicry where some, some food-based proteins or some proteins that are associated with bacteria or viruses end up in this situation where antibodies are made against those items and there's homology between those proteins and the proteins in our body and we get an autoimmune event. And it's super complex. It's really hard to unpack, but I, I will say this, we know more about autoimmune disease than we've ever known in history. We know more about type 2 diabetes than we've ever known in history. In 2010, there were 30,000 PubMed articles with the term type 2 diabetes in it. But yet the rates of these diseases are increasing exponentially. Hmm. So I'm picking up an iPhone right now. This thing is cheaper and better than it's ever been in, in, in known history. And the next iteration is going to be cheaper and better, cheaper Moore's and law. better. Moore's law. This thing's not... The analogy, though, is with medicine... This thing should be a dial 
phone at this point mm-hmm. because we're not moving the the needle forward at all on degenerative could disease. it be because mm. we don't even know where to look like i'll give you an example or you, we're or definitely you, or not you asking the right question or do you yes. think there's a lot of hands in a lot of pockets that are mo- pushing mm-hmm. well I, I mean there's all that stuff but i mean I, I i'm kind of the crazy guy um that's why you're on mind pump by the way exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> Thank you. it's part of my parole stuff too we talked about that earlier um so I, I, I'm kind of crazy. Like, I, you know, if somebody says, hey, do you think um, bioethanol is a good idea? I'm like, well, what's the point of bioethanol? You raise corn, you turn the corn into ethanol to, to run machinery on. It's like, okay, do you get more energy out of that process than you put in? No. So that's a boondoggle. That's a fail, you know? So I have this kind of crazy notion that there are these fundamental laws of nature, thermodynamics, economics, evolution, and if we inform our investigation from that perspective, then we start getting some really good stuff to happen. Mm. The reason why technology has taken off the way that it has is material science, physics, thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, like there's quantum elements to just dealing with like a GPS satellite and all that. There's not a lot of pissing match and, and contention around that. But within medicine, which is a branch of biology and the fundamental tenet of biology is evolution via natural selection. It's a fucking shit show to get people to even say, yeah, man, the evolutionary template is maybe something that we should ask some questions around, right, particularly right. for degenerative disease. Now, if you get hit by a bus or shot, evolution doesn't really matter that much. We're in an acute care state. And when you look at the progress that acute medicine has made over the last 50 years, it is stunning. Oh, Western medicine work, rules in that they area. They can work yeah. miracles on that stuff. But then when you hop right over the fence to just really run-of-the-mill degenerative disease like ulcerative colitis or any type of GI dysfunction, it fails. And it fails epically. Just the uh, proton pump inhibitors that they're giving people to, to deal with gastric like reflux. And- yeah, it's increasing the rates of neurodegenerative disease because those proton pumps are really, really important. And there's knock-on effects with this stuff. So I think... You know, to the degree that this paleo diet concept has really had some legs has been that we've looked at different disease processes like autoimmunity and and GI issues from this evolutionary template. And we've said, okay, maybe some things like grains, legumes and dairy, some commonly immunogenic items, things that people are oftentimes allergic to. And there's not a lot of contention around that. You can just look at, you know, but yeah, it's a fact, you know. So could there be some other immunogenic issues there that could lead into autoimmune disease? And Alessio Fasano used uh, celiac disease as a model for potentially all uh, autoimmune diseases. So uh, you've got a breach in the uh, gut barrier, you've got an inflammatory process, you get this thing called a haptin, which is a exogenous protein and an endogenous protein that gets stuck together. You get an antibody to that, and then the autoimmune process is off and running. So there's some really good proposed mechanisms and possibly more important than that, we have some really good clinical interventions now that are showing some great promise. Uh, Walter Longo did a fasting mimicking diet and even that has been blowing doors off of, you know, basic ketogenic diet or even some of these autoimmune paleo approaches. And it appears to be this like protein recycling, pressing the replay button on the immune system. And it's incredibly powerful. And it's pretty damn easy. I mean, you're asking people to eat a low-calorie diet for five to seven days. Low-calorie, low-protein. Yeah. I was so yeah, surprised exactly. when Lane said that this was something that he would never do. This was something we brought up, too, with intermittent fasting because we're huge fans of it. And I think more people should some, somewhat incorporate it into their life just for the health benefits, yeah, period. Right, Even right. I don't care, weight loss, muscle gain, whatever. Just It should be something that you sporadically just incorporate somewhat right. into your lifestyle because of all the it's benefits the, that are showing. It's, like, it's the, law, the, law of, you know, the law of unintended the consequences that uh, uh, as ma- mankind just has a horror we just have a terrible time um, working with like for example um, we have an acute issue infection invent antibiotics boom we fixed we fixed infection yeah, we fixed unintended consequence of that though what are the unintended unintended consequences of overusing antibiotics mm-hmm. uh, look at you know food like oh my god we need to you know people tend to be under you know underfed when it comes to calories this is a problem throughout all of mankind People died from not having enough food. We fixed it. Let's grow yeah. corn. Let's grow wheat. It's Let's abundance. domesticate animals. We have all this food. What are the un- unintended consequences of that? And we tend to ignore that kind of stuff. And that's what yeah. I think we're stuck in with with you know modern Farming society. Fruits and everything to be more sweet, and you know changing that whole chemistry and everything. That's else. it. And so you know I wanted to bring when I brought up the whole like commonality with auto autoimmune. I find it interesting now that in mouse models. 
they've almost or pretty much cured depression in in mouse models by changing their microbiome. Right. Mm -hmm. Could depression, anxiety, ADD, ADHD, autism, could those all be kind of autoimmune issues? I mean, this is a question that, uh, because there's an inflammatory component to all of those, and now they're finding this gut connection to the mind as well. So it's kind of fascinating. And, you know, of course, there's been some studies that show that some of these nomadic, you know, hunter-gatherer societies don't suffer from things like depression, anxiety, nearly the rate that, you know, we do in these modern societies. So it's all important stuff to, to look at. But what is, it, what is it with, I want to talk a little bit more specifically now, because what I've noticed with these communities of autoimmune issues is that all, they all seem to do well when they avoid gluten, for example. Right. Just gluten. Let's just talk about that for a second. Like, what's the deal with gluten? It, gluten and, and wheat in particular, you know, there's a remarkable family of proteins and also some sugars, like some of these fermentable sugars that go go along with, with uh, wheat type grains in particular. And they seem to be really immunogenic. Like they just kind of piss off the immune response. And we don't really know exactly why that is. Um, and there's two pieces to it. There's the plant and there's the person or the organism eating it. And so on the plant side, the reproductive structure of grains is the grain itself. That's the thing we're consuming. So like if you eat a piece of fruit, usually you ditch the seeds or if you swallow the seeds, the seeds get deposited in some warm, you know, uh, 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 well, well fed, uh, uh, medium and you grow the seeds later. And, but with the, the grains and legumes, that is the reproductive structure. And they have some really potent anti-predation chemicals in them. And if you look at some of the Weston A. Price stuff, where they talk about soaking and fermenting and sprouting these things, those were all an attempt to reduce these anti-nutrients and these immunogenic proteins. They didn't know that that's what they were doing, but they noticed that when they did that stuff, people suffered low, you know, fewer rates of like mineral deficiencies or the diseases that we would see with these deficiency states. So everything in biology has thorns or horns or poison or something mm-hmm. to pre- defend itself. If you remove those things, this is part of the reason why like domesticated fruits and vegetables just get crushed by pests because they're super tasty and they're really low in tannins and toxins, mm-hmm. which make them taste better. There's a low barrier to entry. To yeah, there's a low barrier yeah. of entry to that. So then we have to hit them with like pesticides, which that has, again, knock on <laughs> effects. So we've got that side of the story, which there's definitely an immunogenic potential with these grains. But then you've got the epigenetic, you know, interface of mm-hmm. the, so let's say a human being eat, eating it. And what's interesting is the person who expresses celiac disease, and and we'll say also gluten sensitivity, but specifically celiac disease, one of the most informative things that I find in my research is we'll take a particular disease like celiac, or I'll even go like BRCA1, like the breast cancer gene one. I go BRCA1 evolutionary advantage, and you get a bunch of papers that talk about- Let's stop for a second. I got to explain that. So you're talking about a genetic- so. the the breast cancer gene this is one that if you get tested for and i know this because i had a family member who we tested people around her because she died at early age of a a cancer she shouldn't have and if you find that gene you have something like a 70 something percent chance they'll say of getting breast cancer right and what you're saying is you're looking at this gene that exists and there might have been an evolutionary advantage to having this gene. Like, not, why does it exist? Not might. It did. Otherwise, it wouldn't wow. be there. So, what? Yeah. okay, go And into this that. is, again, some of the stuff that the standard reductionist science is just shitting the bed on, and particularly on, on the <laughs> clinical side, because it, so we're, we're, we're telling people, okay, go get screened and then maybe do a prophylactic mastectomy. And we're not even, maybe there's arguments for that, maybe not. I still think that there's a massive amount of epigenetic input there. Like, the, very rarely do genes guarantee a you know specific outcome like we can tweak a lot of things mm-hmm. with diet and lifestyle changes and whatnot but you know we're not again even asking that question was there a benefit to this like why why does it was exist this beneficial why yeah why yeah. does it exist so even in the counseling process it's like hey and the, the people with this geno this specific genotype tend to have more children they tend to have fewer infectious uh, uh, situations like there's all this evolutionary advantage then at a pre-westernized situation would have been great. And now for some reason, maybe it's elevated estrogen levels, maybe it's elevated insulin, maybe it's combinations of these things, it may end up being a liability. But we can manage that if we retro-engineer this and ask the right questions. So, so. I'm gonna make I'm gonna put this super layman terms, right? You got this gene, which is a blueprint. Um, and your lifestyle, diet, thoughts, whatever, all the things that can influence how your how your daily life or you know, long-term life. 
all those things can tell that blueprint to go <laughs> one way or the other. Or maybe that blueprint existed to do something, but <coughs> it existed during a time when we didn't have all these other factors. Now you throw those other factors on, which is epigenetics, and the, one of the unintended consequences of this yeah. gene now is breast cancer. Right. Okay. And, and in the case of celiac disease, people with celiac disease have a much greater, uh, an enhanced immune response, particularly in the gut. And these people tend to be uh, of lineage where um, Neolithic farming is pretty recent in their past, Northern European. So you had people who went from living in scattered hunter-gatherer groups to larger extended family groups, and they're living in proximity with animals. And we see this, you know, like the swine flu and all these different things. Like when you start getting multiple species living on top of one another, then there's an increased likelihood of some sort of squirrely event happening from an infectious disease. So it was clearly a survival advantage for the celiac tending, tending people to have an enhanced immune response. But in this modern environment, when they get exposed to wheat, specifically gliadin in the, the gluten uh, matrix, then for whatever reason, that tendency towards this overexpression or this enhanced expression of immune response results in autoimmunity, gut permeability, and, and just a ton of different problems. But, you know, all of these... It, you're really hard pressed to find a, a modern uh, uh, disease scenario, like even things like a sickle cell anemia. It had survival advantage malaria, for, right? for right. malaria. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting is people with sickle cell tendencies, when they move to somewhere like Europe or the United States, um, you may go from a population that had a 40% penetrance of that particular genotype. And it may be gone in like four generations because it is nasty enough now that there are selection pressures against mm -hmm. it and you just don't need it. There's no longer advantage, but there's a lot of costs associated mm -hmm. with it. Yeah, a, a good example of what you're talking about, because when I get I've gotten into debates with people who are like, no, the evolutionary fat, not that, you know, this is what you need to look at. And I'll say, look, here's one simple example. You can go to different regions of the world and you can clearly see uh, a very base. Here's a very simple one. Lactose intolerance. Far more common when you go to Africa and the Middle East than if you go to like Northern European societies. And right. why? Northern Euro European societies, uh, they domesticated cattle and had dairy in their diets for a much, much longer. If you use Africa as an example, for the most part, lactose intolerance is through the roof, except for a particular region where they've been domesticating cattle for thousands of years and if you ma if you look at those two people they don't have the same right. gene it's that different helps them. adaptations it's a different yeah. adaptation yeah. but both of them help them break down lactase right. it's clearly uh, ev you know evolutionary and you made a, a comment earlier about just an infinite number of factors that go into how you know food affects us um, you know everything from activity to the types of foods we eat and all these different things it only makes sense that we should probably default to how we probably have been eating for the last, you know, 100,000 years or whatever. I mean, is that where some of the, that's what some of the premise behind, you know, paleo type eating yeah, comes from, right? And, you know, I mean, that gets sticky too because it, it's, um, do we have the same types of foods around? Have they been modified? Like, can you even find that type of stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, uh, but I think that there's some really good, guidelines that we can pull from that. Like when you look at uh, some of these uh, pre-agricultural societies, like they tended to eat within certain macronutrient ratios. They tended to eat a meal or two a day. They tended to go to bed when the sun went down and they got up when the sun came up. Um, they were awash in kind of a microbial, you know, uh, deal. When they look at the, the Hadza, like when they butcher an animal, the stomach and intestinal contents, the guys wipe it on themselves, you know? Oh, I didn't know and that. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, they literally, I mean, it, it, it's... <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> wow. But, but, you know, and they will eat some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, foregut contents because it's fermenting. So there's basically, like, oh, wow. sauerkraut in there. If you got a zebra and it, it's in the, the foregut, then these guys will eat that stuff. And I mean... And it's highly prized yeah. and valued. Yeah, yeah, and and it's not killing them. Like it would probably crush me. Like I pro I might not even live long enough to make the adaptation to get into that <laughs> that kind of approach. But that's kind of the base level norm, you know. Like I, my wife just got a Rhodesian Ridgeback, and like this dog, and and we have a uh, African type cat. Like it's part wildcat, and so these things just hunt and kill everything on our property. But there's like mice and moles and everything, and they'll go hunt them up and eat them, and they eat the whole thing. You know, they're not like pulling a fillet out of it and eating that one thing. It's it's like raw gut contents 
and they're put, putting it down the hatch. And that's probably, like, there's probably on some genetic, epigenetic level an expectation of that. And if we don't do that or something like that, and that's where maybe, you know, consistent fermented foods are valuable. This is where some intermittent fasting is valuable. Some protein fasting is valuable. These, this periodicity and also these uh, cyclic exposures are probably important for some sort of a, a healthy baseline. You said protein fasting. I, I want to get into that because I brought that up. It's been a few episodes ago now where I talked about how I think there may be a benefit to protein fasting just because you look at the, the way that protein signals the body and how some of that signaling is what uh, is a driver in cancer. And it doesn't necessarily mean if you eat a lot of protein, you get cancer. But if you have cancer, eating a lot of protein may, you know, accelerate its or you know, make it proliferate a little faster or, or give it, make it more aggressive. You just said protein fasting. Nobody in our industry, especially the muscle building, muscle building industry, oh, that's the magic, will touch that. Yeah, that's yeah. the macronutrient you can't get enough of. Right. It does no harm. It's thermogenic and it's great for you. Let's talk about protein fasting. Why, what is that and why is that even a good idea? So we have these roughly three macronutrients, protein, carbs, fat. People are making the argument that ketones are a fourth macronutrient. We don't have to go down that rabbit hole right now. <laughs> but, you know, the so, the you know, protein makes up the lean muscle mass. It's a key factor in our immune re- response, our immune system. And maybe backing up a little bit, it, if we pulled anything out of even just a little glance at this ancestral health template, I could I, I think I could make a credible argument that chronic anything becomes bad chronic Mm. sun exposure chronic lack of sun exposure chronic overfeeding amen and so you know there appear to be some values to turning these signal switches on and off and also so the Walter longo case again so what was interesting with that is they had a group of people with ms that they split up and they had one group that did this fasting mimicking diet low protein low calorie five to seven days and they had a ketogenic diet arm of that the ketogenic group did okay, but not spectacular. Everybody generally felt better, but they didn't have any like complete remission. Whereas I think the fasting mimicking group had a 25 or 28% remission. Something ridiculous. It was ridiculous, you know? And so there's something about that really just gnarly punctuated change. So they went Mm. from normal eating to low calorie, low protein, that low protein state causes a stress response even that, you're, he doesn't you're even like to pressed. use that term. Yeah, he yeah, like to use right. that term. yeah, and it's really an interesting perspective. You know, mm. he's like, no, this isn't a stress response. This is a normalizing response. Mm. The stress response is being chronically like recalibrated your whole life. You know, yeah. yeah, it's literally just putting things to back the way they should. And mm. we, which the first time I heard that, because I'm always like, oh, it's a hormetic stress response, and, mm-hmm. and then he was like, no, 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 no. You know, <laughs> so and this Italian bunch, yeah. thing, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, it's a really good yeah. point. So. You know, and there is a little bit of stuff in the the literature, like the uh, some old Bulgarian weightlifting stuff, where two days a week they would do a super low protein intake, and then this was part of their volume phase, their accumulation phase, and then right on the heels of that, they would still kind of partition the protein, but it would be like one mondo protein meal at the end of the day. It'd be like a bolus of protein. Yeah, and it would be like I remember grams this of study. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's really interesting. And, you know, can you get a Ronnie Coleman-sized person doing this stuff? I don't know. Maybe it just needs to be all drugs all the time, all food all the time. I, I, that's a I bad don't example, know, too, because that's a diseased state, if you ask me. Forced, mm. forced state. It, 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 it kind of is. And you're using insulin and thyroid and all this stuff to kind of tweak the the levers. And, mm. you know, I mean, it, it, there's possibly some You're a, some you're a chemistry set that. by that point. You, know you are. <laughs> yeah. 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 A super impressive one. But yeah, absolutely, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But – you know, for someone that's not heading super far down that that path and maybe wants to strike a balance between the performance health longevity story, maybe there's some benefit. And I've kind of noticed this and people I, I think have noticed this. There was a uh, uh, the hypertrophy specific training protocol and the guy was actually making the argument that you need to take some time off, mm-hmm. that that consistent repetitious exposure mm-hmm. actually ends up kind of upregulating the mTOR pathways or, or the myostatin pathways. And so it actually kind of inhibits it. So you need to go into almost an untrained state, but not so far that you really start degrading, but then you layer another round mm-hmm. of training mm-hmm. onto it. And so what I'm getting from that is that there's this periodicity and this cyclical nature and that this just chronic exposure, whether it's protein or strength training or what have you, 
may not have that ultimate benefit. Like we need to have some punctuation in this. Whole the thing. Undula- the that, undulating. We, we talk yeah. about this because we're we're. I mean, we're heavy into programming, right? So, and we talk about the the importance of undulating your programming. It's nutrition seems to be the same way too. Right. It's, it, the more and right. more we look at, it, it's why we recommend yeah. even none of us are vegan guys whatsoever. But we recommend doing a day where it's like all vegetables and right. no real pro- protein for meats, and you just go all nuts and seeds, maybe or none at all. You know, like right. just because people are, especially in the fitness industry, being fed this. And I remember, and the reason I think that why we're all so passionate about it is because even being trainers at one point, I re- I remember being that guy who. I was so afraid that not to eat my protein that like I would over consume all kinds of crap and calories or whatever as long as I made sure I got my protein intake and that would be like and if you were under you'd freak out it would freak out like muscle was going to fall off the next day right. you know that's, right. that's negative the nitrogen balance yeah. <laughs> yeah you know and it's it's funny because for a while now I've been doing these days where I just go vegan and they're very low calorie they're very it's all it's all you know cooked leafy greens and some raw ones and very little seeds and no legumes and I notice when I go back to eating protein uh, one or two days later, I get almost this rebound like anabolic effect. And there is some science to, that shows that there's like this desensitizing effect mm-hmm. from repeated exposure. Mm-hmm. So even from an athletic standpoint, mm-hmm. it would make sense right. to kind of do that. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and this is going to be controversial because I've brought this up before on the show. But right now in fitness, now we're seeing people questioning, you know, uh, doing things all the time regularly. But one thing nobody questions is that you need to drink water all the time, all day long, tons and tons of water. Now, if we go back from an evolutionary standpoint, number one, there wasn't protein around all the time. When we had it, we ate it. And when we didn't have it, we didn't eat it. There wasn't fruit all the time, but we had it, we ate it. And we, when it wasn't around, we, we, we didn't eat it. We usually slept when we could. And sometimes maybe it's a good idea to not sleep, but usually it's a good idea to sleep when it's dark because you don't want to be out when predators can right. hurt you. So if we, if we continue down that evolutionary path, doesn't it make sense, and I don't know if there's any science to support this, I haven't looked this up, but doesn't it kind of make sense to, rather than drinking water all day long, to kind of drink it within a period of time? Because I don't imagine that humans were around fresh water all the time. They probably went long periods without it and then drank a bunch at a period. T- do you think there would be any benefit to that? I, I, um, it's very I don't speculatory. Know about specifically benefit, but I think that... I'll answer it this way. I think that people are neurotic about overhydrating, and it's it, it's uh, it's just even though I'm sitting here with my giant jug of it, but when I'm when I'm jabbering, I do right. That's totally like what are you trying to do here, Sal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come but on. um, but I, I think that that's kind of one of these neurotic. It's kind of almost this, this folk wisdom deal. It's like a, a you know Mark Twain deal. It's like mm-hmm. oh, you need to eat, you know drink all this water and everything. It just sounds great, and it's so Your reasonable. top five tips. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's just. It, I, I just don't see where it's coming from. And there's some decent research that very, very, very rarely do people die of dehydration. Sure. I mean, it's really rare because it's a situation where they can't get to water. But the situation where people will hyperhydrate and die due to hyponatremia <laughs> is all the time. You know, it's like every football season, every new recruit of military, you know, personnel, every time that there's a marathon people hyperhydrate and they end up dead from it. And uh, Tim Noakes wrote a, a great book on this, Waterlogged. And uh, mm. so that that's kind of my slippery way of, of not <laughs> quite answering that. Well, I think, I, think what caused oh, yeah, that, I think what caused that is, you know, or at least in my experience, when I'd have clients and I'd actually start to dive into their water intake is that, quite frankly, most the average Americans don't drink enough water. They're drinking all this other shit. Right. Sugary right. drinks and, right. you know, lots of coffee. And so we're not getting a lot of water. So I think that I think that was the response, like the fitness industry always does, is the extreme on the other side. Right. A majority of these people are we're helping out. They're not having enough water. Now you need lots of water. Now you need I, more I just, water. Now more I just water. think it would be inst- interesting to look at because it seems like, like you talk about, like there's an evolution evolutionary factor that comes into medicine, health, psychology. Like there's, a, there's a strong evolutionary factor that we tend to ignore. And if we just keep looking down that path, I think it'll point us to some pretty interesting studies. I'd love to look at that because there's no way in hell like humans were had fucking water every hour right. all day long. There's no, no way. Yeah. Right, I'm yeah. sure we saw it. We drank the hell out of it and then didn't go and went without right. it for hours. And, right. you know, I'm sure it was nearby, but... You get no, my point. Ed, Art Devaney made an interesting observation, and I had, had a paper to support this, but that uh, mild dehydration, mild to moderate dehydration really enhanced growth hormone secretion because the some of the stress response, and it tended to shift you more into a fat mobilizing state, and the fat mobilization was a little bit more benign with regards to uh, uh, 
hydration status and all that type hmm. of stuff. So it was pretty interesting. That you is know? interesting. Yeah, I yeah. like. Yeah, I like. That's. I just. It's just. I find that kind of stuff fascinating, <laughs> and I like to go there because it's like a. It's like the third rail. Like, no, don't touch that. Right. Well, right. now that now that we're getting right. this crazy, right? On all these things that we, you know, that we're speculating that might have benefit, and ones that we do know already. I want to ask your uh, Rob, and I got. I know you've got to have a ton of people that reach out to you, you know, after the fact, right? They're all they're fucked up. They've got all they got leaky gut going on. They got the psoriasis going on. They got all these issues that are going on autoimmune, and they're a mess. And they come to you for help. How does a guy like you take all the information and all the things you know? And how do you how do you get someone in the right direction like that? What are the big rocks you focus on first? What are some of the struggles you notice like telling someone like how to help them out? Because oh, you, you got to know it's not as cut and dry as, oh, you've been doing all this bad shit forever. Yeah. This is what you do and they fall to a team right. and everything's all good. You, you know, it's interesting because maybe 10 years ago, I would get a lot of reasonably simple to help stuff and it really wasn't getting into medical issues. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, okay, you're overweight or your sleep's disturbed. We can we can uh, tick some really sim simple boxes and get you moving forward now. The emails that I get now, to your point, the people are broken mm -hmm. because there's so much good information out there that the vast majority of people, if they've got any initiative, they've done most of the heavy mm -hmm. lifting. And it's either worked really well for them or if it hasn't, then they really need a lot more help. And the, fortunately, there are some people out there, you know, like Chris Kresser is an amazing practitioner and he has a practitioner training program. The Cleveland Clinic is uh, certifying all their new graduating doctors in functional medicine. So compared to 10 years ago, like there's a lot more physicians that are maybe steeped in this kind of evolutionary medicine perspective. Mm. And so there are folks that I can refer out. I'm actually on the board of directors of a clinic here in Reno, which is a functional medicine clinic. We did a two-year pilot study with the Reno Police, Reno Fire Department, found 35 folks that were at high risk for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, put them on a lowish carb paleo diet, modified their sleep and exercise as best we could. And based off the changes in their health risk assessment parameters, it's estimated the pilot study alone saved the city of Reno $22 million with a 33 to one return on investment. Wow. So wow. we've been working to kind of gear Can't this thing that. up and take it out, out to the masses. And, and yeah, this is where when, when guys on the internet are like, you're that paleo. Do you guys ever say the R word that ends with a D? Mm. Oh, yeah. That's that seems to be the one oh, that gets oh. people really mad. <laughs> you could say it. I've know. got like three. He emails says it all the time. Yeah. I, I'm not going to say I'm it. I'm getting it, better at it. It's oh. like the one <laughs> word that you will get crucified. <laughs> it is the so. one word. We've said everything you're, else on here, but yeah. I've gotten more emails. Just say oh. imbecile. Yeah, yeah, you're the yeah. paleo imbecile, and, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I also run a medical clinic that you know, <laughs> did this, what do you do? So, <laughs> oh, um, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I'm fortunate in that I'm pretty well networked into a, a system of practitioners. Like we just had an email earlier from somebody, they have a dear friend, a uh, friend has stage four metastatic breast cancer. What are we going to do? And so we're hooking them up with, uh, a spin-off of some folks that are attached to the Charlie Foundation. The Charlie Foundation is a ketogenic diet clinic for kids, specifically for epilepsy and other neurodegenerative mm -hmm. diseases. But they've also been kind of sticking their finger into a little bit of, of uh, using ketosis, fasting, proteins, fasting as adjunctive therapy with conventional treatment. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get them hooked up and and uh, I believe so. the FDA is actually looking to approve a uh, fasting protocol for adjuvant therapy with chemotherapy mm -hmm. yeah, you, that just reminded me I gotta ask your opinion we saw this I don't know if it's been it's been passed yet or not did you see where they're going with these stomach pumps where people yeah. actually can oh get surgery where they put a, mixed by a tube crawl. in their stomach and then they eat and then they yeah, I mean, at a minimum, it should be like old Rome where you have to go tickle the back of your throat with a feather and throw <laughs> up and at least suffer the indignity of throwing up and like rotting your teeth out at some yeah. point. It, it's Make kinda... it inconvenient somehow, yeah? Yeah. At I, least. I, I Does can't... that not scare the shit out of you, though, when you see stuff like that? Is it... well, and what is really crazy is that's going to be like insurance reimbursed and tax uh, money covering yeah. that stuff. And that's what I'm like, fucking saying. Really? Yeah, yeah we'll yeah. all pay for that. Yeah. Uh, well, unless uh, unless uh, you know, government pays for all of it, and then the government will tell them to fuck off. That's what will end up happening at some point. At some point, yeah. 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 Then, then they'll own your body, so. right? Um, why do you think there's such so? Why do you think it seems like it's almost like an addiction? problem with uh, like let's talk about america oh, let's for, talk for about that period addiction because yeah, I, you know what, what you are, can't say that word either to people oh right, god yeah. you could be addicted to well, food you're oh. demonizing that kind of food yeah, yeah because it's not it's it's an epidemic uh i don't think people realize this and nobody really talks about this but 
the obesity diabetes epidemic, and it is an epidemic, th- threatens this country, and we'll just talk about this country, more than almost any other threat. Uh, the biggest threat we had in, in modern times with the Soviet Union, they're gone now, so there's no more of that existen- existential, you know, blow up the whole world threat. Nobody can really do that to us now, or at least there's not that risk as big as, as it was then. People don't realize, like, if we don't fix the obesity diabetes epidemic, we're going to go bankrupt. Oh, I mean, the military has had these these discussions, and they look specifically at our healthcare system. And it's a national security diabetes issue, as a national wow. security issue, and people are kind of like, "Oh, that's bullshit." It's these jihadis in in the hilltops, and it's like, no, that's not what's going to take us down. Our subsidized food system that's making us so sick that it's so incredibly expensive, We're killing to ourselves, it, that will take us down at the kneecaps, and nobody really cares too much about it. And you you really are the the crazy person talking about. Mm. any of that stuff. we are projecting i think to, at some like to like 300 percent gdp in a very short period of time will be spent on just uh, diabetes related stuff just to be so, just, so yeah. you that seems you, like a good angle though to really come at the money aspect of it though to get people's attention it's not sexy or scary yeah. like if i'm a politician and i'm on a stage and i'm saying hey everybody you know we need to fix our obesity epidemic because yeah, right. that's going to destroy our country and then the guy over there is going no it's terrorist and that's scarier like yeah. i'm i'm asking People you basically identify with that more well i'm yeah. asking you to look in the mirror a little bit right. and it's changes we all need to make and that guy over there is saying no we could just go bomb some people right. and we'll fix it it's not sexy man yeah. it ain't going to happen it's the accountability it's ladder bro it's always it's easy. always everybody else you know what i'm right. saying that nobody wants to look at themselves and the things that they could be doing differently right you know but on that addiction thing yes, or, you know why there. do we tend to to do this stuff if i get this analogy right it's pretty good if i fuck it up it's pretty terrible but um <laughs> we'll, we'll cross so we'll our try. fingers yeah we'll yeah. cross our fingers so somebody's out hiking they trip and fall they fall in a creek and they go underwater and they go to pop their head up and they're snagged and they're like an inch below the water but they they keep their head about them they're like okay i'm stuck but i'm gonna wiggle this thing out i can hold my breath about a minute goes by and they're like, oh shit, okay, this is getting serious. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get out of here. And they start thrashing and starting to, you know, blowing bubbles. And then one last adrenaline driven explosion, they're able to break this twig that's had them pinned down. They explode out of the water, get this life saving gulp of air. Would you guys vilify that person? No. Is there anything morally wrong with that person? Are they no. broken or they weak willed? No. Mm-mm. Well, the tendency to want to eat everything that's not nailed down is a fundamental survival mm-hmm. mechanism. Mm-hmm. When you, again, you look at this evolutionary biology deal, if you can peel back and, and step beyond the last hundred years or at least 50 years of ubiquitous food and leisure and luxury, it was a tooth and nail survival struggle for mm-hmm. everybody every day, all the time. Nat- so, natural right. state of humanity. That's, nat- that's a natural state of it's everything except state. humans and our pets, which mm-hmm. is why we and our pets are fat and and, yeah. and, and dying from metabolic issues. Ironically, so, right? Any other animal that's uh, yeah. wild and free, it's pretty good to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, we at, at this genetic level, this thermodynamic level, we are wired to eat everything that's not nailed down and then go take a nap. When a when a bear eats a meal, it doesn't consult its Fitbit, and it's like, oh, man, that was about 600 calories of rabbit and blueberries. I'm going to do some jumping jacks and burpees to burn it off. It goes and sleeps, and this is what anything in a natural environment would do. This is our genetic tendency, but now we live in an environment where we can get an infinite variety of flavor and palate options. Mm. It can be delivered to your door. You, you work in your underwear. You never leave the house. You don't exercise. You pop this thing in the microwave. You've got all these other options in the pantry. And so we've kind of pushed this survival tendency to a point that is maximized in a way, but it's maximized in a way that makes us sick. But it, you, if you are willing to vilify people for not being able to turn down the little Debbie snack cakes and the, yeah. the, the, the Snickers and whatever, if, if you're willing to vilify those folks, then you need to be willing to vilify the person who would do anything to get their head out from under a, a, some water because they're drowning? Both of them are survival mechanisms, and that's a that's it, a great it's analogy. Hardwired, yeah. Now, why? But why do you think we have like people are overfed? Right? They've got all these calories. They're overnourished from that standpoint. Appetite through the roof, and it's it's connected to the types of foods that they eat. Because you see in study after study, when people eat a diet that's more either paleo or keto or ones that avoids a lot of these processed foods and they're and they're given they're not given calorie restrictions they're saying okay right. eat this these are the kinds of foods you can eat eat as much as you want or whatever just eat until you're full or and, you know if you're not if you're not hungry don't eat 
They tend to eat less than people who can eat whatever, lots of processed food. Right. So there's that component as well. So do, do, what's the one thing that will get you labeled as a disordered eater? Binge eating. E- well, eating well, typically. Uh-oh. I mean, they oh, might oh, say, oh, yeah, I, binge I eating and stuff mm. like that. But I mean, re- you know, a binge eater, if you if you go to a dietitian, you're like, I'm a binge eater. And they're like, oh, you're, you're, you're among good good friends, you know. We, 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 <laughs> hallelujah, brother. And we, <laughs> you're, we're there. But if you go and you're like, yeah, I eat kind of a low-carb ketogenic diet, then it, it's like when in a invasion of body snatchers where they're like, oh, you know, it's you. <laughs> and, and you, you, um, you have a situation there where the only thing that gets vilified is good eating. Mm. And what's interesting, whether it's paleo or vegan or low carb or what have you, each one of these strategies is effectively limiting palate options. If you do this kind of high carb, lowish fat, high fiber kind of gig, then there's a bunch of tasty foods that you're not going to eat. Mm. And, and that's fine. And there's some tasty foods that you are going to eat. And conversely, if you do um, uh, low carb, high fat. There's some great things like bacon and chicharrones and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And then there's some stuff that you're not going to eat, but it is inevitably that interface of these palate mixes, you know, that get us wow, into I've never heard anybody make deep that water. Connection. And, uh, I, there's a great, um, as part of my book, I have a link to this thing and I have a link to it on my blog and maybe I'll, I'll ship it to you guys, but there's this guy, Adam Rickman, who did the show man versus food. Mm-hmm. And he oh, would yeah. go out and do I these eating challenges yeah. And so this one, I saw this like six or seven years ago, it just stuck in my head. It was so interesting. And I I was like, I'm going to use that someday for something. And so he's doing this thing called the Kitchen Seek Ice Cream Challenge. So it's an ice cream sundae that's in a kitchen sink, delivered in a kitchen sink. And it's like eight pounds of ice cream and hot fudge and sprinkles and the whole deal. And he needs to eat it in X amount of time for him to win. I don't know what he wins, like a, you know, Diabetes. Of yeah, the year I, was or, say. I, I, I don't really know, but <laughs> so there have only been three sickness. three people that have succeeded in this thing, and so he starts tearing into this. He gets about a third of the way through, and then he starts totally bogging down. Like he is visually like turning green, and you see him trying to take a bite, and he starts gagging. So. I don't think anybody would argue that a well-constructed ice cream sundae tastes pretty damn good. Mm-hmm. Like we would call it hyper palatable. It, it probably goes above and beyond what our normal neuroregulation of appetite would, would, you know, turn off. But at some point, even that you're going to get bored of it effectively. There's this a process called fat palate fatigue. You're just going to be done. So in the standard dietetics model, it's like, well, his belly's full. So he's, he's all done. What he does is really fascinating. He orders a plate of, extra salty, extra crunchy French fries. And he starts taking a bite of the French fry and a bite of ice cream and a bite of the French fry and a bite of the ice cream. Mm. And he is able to finish the ice cream sundae only because he eats more food, wow. like 1500 calories of oh more food. God. And this is where I have some, fascinating. I have some issues with the, if it fits your macro folks and I'm in kind of like, you know, battle with some of those guys. It works for some people. You can have a little portion of Twinkie and a little portion of this, a little portion of that, but it's clearly not working for the masses. The whole like eat less, move more, everything in moderation. Mm -hmm. What the fuck does moderation mean when you go down a a snack food aisle in a supermarket? If you don't like the sweet, then the salty crunchy is going to get you. I guarantee it, you know? And uh, what's the Lay's potato chip line? Bet you can't eat just one. (laughs) And these fuckers are winning. And and what's it just... So that I completely spin out on this, and this will be like the lowest Keep rated spinning. podcast you guys have ever I had. Love it. But the get, the people who engineer these foods study evolutionary biology. They study the neurophysiology of appetite. The when Facebook and Twitter were clearly becoming, they, they recognized them as this addictive process. They got in. They said, "Why?" Hmm. And they were, "Oh, novelty and novelty drives human behavior and novelty seeking and dopamine." And so the people who develop addictive social media platforms, the people who are engineering these foods that are hyper palatable and legitimately addictive, they understand this evolutionary bio- biology template back and forwards. But our gatekeepers, the dietitians, the doctors, and most of the internet, you, you know, uh, uh, opinionated people, they're still in a pissing match about whether or not this evolutionary template has any merit at all. The people who are making billions of dollars a year, potentially trillions of dollars a year off this, fully get this whole thing, and there's absolutely no contention on it. So, yeah. I, I 100% agree wow. with you. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to give you a scenario here um, that might be kind of controversial, and maybe it's a little too black and white, but if you've got... Two groups of people, and uh, we're trying to get them to improve their overall health and wellness. Everything from being leaner, 
to also having better blood markers of health, you know, every you know, triglycerides, cholesterol is a type of cholesterol, all that stuff. In group one, we tell them, here's your calories, here's your macro, stay within those. And then group two, we say, here's the food quality we want you to focus on. Avoid foods that are heavily processed, whatever. Let's focus on food quality instead. Which group do you think, which one would you prefer or do you think will do better in the long term? The one that focuses on food quality or the one that focuses on macros and calories? Man, it, it's a really good question and it still kind of boils down to what's the just kind of like environment that these people are in. It, it, both of these things will work pretty well in a metabolic ward where all the food's being controlled, controlled as it goes in and whatnot. And in this, but it, I, I will say in this free living kind of scenario, if you, you need a couple of things. One, you need social contact and accountability. And this is where like a health coach or a dietitian that, got, that has their head screwed on straight. This is where like CrossFit gyms are really, really valuable. A well-run CrossFit gym, the coach is going to talk to you about sleep and photo period. They're going to talk to you about effective nutrition. They're gonna, there's going to be some exercise baked in the cake. Hopefully, they're not giving you rhabdo. And then there's a community piece. But that community piece ends up being the anchor that helps to keep people moving forward. Mm -hmm. All these Fitbits and and uh, my fitness pal and everything, the, the holy grail of fitness and health and medicine is to be able to take an app and get people to interface with the app, and that's going to affect behavior change. And they have completely failed. There was just a study that came out that there was a group of people, they were two groups of people, they were instructed in healthy eating. One group wore a, a basically an, a, a you know, how a pedometer app, kind of a My Fitness Pal deal. Another group didn't do anything. The group that was monitoring how much they moved lost almost no weight compared to the other group. The other group lost more weight. So that scrutiny and the monitoring can actually be really problematic. And to the degree that I've seen people kind of spin out, the weighing and measuring of food is kind of a gateway for neurotic behavior. One hundred, we see that all the time because and we I, work. In well, I got to see it firsthand when I decided to get into competing and. I'll never forget being backstage and seeing all these people that before I, before I got into it, I thought like they must be know their stuff like inside and out. I mean, to get your physique to look at that level, right. even I as a trainer have never got down to 2% body fat. And until I got there and I started talking to these people, I was like, holy shit, like they, some of these guys have way worse eating habits. The way they're training is – I was blown away. And then I thought, okay, well, maybe it's because – I'm at the MPC level. These are like the rookies. They really don't get it yet. Then I worked my way all the way up to the professional level, worse. and it does. It gets even crazier. Right. Eating and, disorders. Yeah, right. they're more neurotic, and and the, there's this crazy. It's it's and the, what makes me frustrated, and what uh, I get really passionate about when I talk about this is they've made it cool. It's cool to extreme diet and then binge like crazy right. and excuse it with the bulking period. Right. And it's just, uh, people don't realize well, what they, the fuck they're getting they're, into, they're not, they, what they're, they're not, setting themselves up for long term. And they're right. not taking the psychological component because it's clearly a symptom eruption. There's That's a tech, that's a scientific term for what happens when you restrict the hell out of yourself. Or look, you get a guy, a uh, normal dude, and you make him self-restrict uh, sex. He's not allowed to masturbate. He's not allowed to have sex. Let him do that, and you're going to see some symptom eruptions, and they're going to come out in weird ways, in in uh, you know quote unquote you know unhealthy ways because he's suppressed I, it to a certain. I point. want a raincoat and a hat. What if I have to be near that guy? <laughs> <laughs> and and you see that with the uh. you see that with I see it with IIF Wham crowd. I have clients that'll hire me, and they're so neurotic about counting their macros that I'll tell, you know, some of my female clients, like, okay, I don't want you to train. I don't want you to, to, to count for the next week. I want, I want you to just try and eat intuitive, intuitively for a week and they'll cry. I can't do that. If I go off, what if this happened? What mm -hmm. if, it's like, there's obviously a psychological component we're not even taking into right. account. And almost inevitably, and this is another point that I end up just super pissing people off, but um, similar to you guys, like I've been doing this a while, uh, uh, I guess like almost 20 years we've, own multiple CrossFit type gyms. I'm on the board of, of directors with this medical clinic. But um, so that psychological piece that gets focused on food, it's not about the food. It's something else. It's like, daddy didn't love me. Somebody somewhere told me I was fat or ugly or not worth it or whatever, or, or even some peripheral deal. But then they figure out that they're able to garner a lot of attention and they're able to exact this control on their lives from this focus on eating and fitness and the focus on the food ends up 
pretty much guaranteeing that you never address the underlying issue. You're able to keep chasing this thing. It's like calculating the last decimal point of pi. You just keep going and mm. going and going and it never gets there. And um, I've talked to people a lot about this and uh, people want to hit me. They want to shoot me. Like they get really angry. You're hitting like, deep, man. Because they're like, no, I, ha- I need a healthy relationship with food. And I'm like, no, nah, it's not actually about the food. The food is a symptom. And the other issue who didn't love you, who didn't take care of you, who wasn't there for you. And then you start like, it's that goodwill hunting moment where you think that they're going to like take it's the, not your yeah. fault. Yeah. And, uh, it, but that is yeah. ultimately oh. where you can go with them no. if you can get them to, to embrace this stuff, but you can get so spun out on all these details around the nutrition and the food that you can keep yourself distracted over a lifetime and never actually address that underlying issue. And it's going to have knock on effects in every other element of your life your relationships with significant others, children, coworkers. And so, and, and uh, this may sound like super touchy feely. I literally have the emotional acuity of a Vulcan. Like I have to look at people and I'm like, <laughs> okay, they're sad. And I should respond like this. Like I don't. <laughs> Pat on uh, back. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, totally. Like John Wellborn and I, when we did our 23 and me, like we are both, we have this outlier where our empathy is like six standard deviations below the norm. We're just kind of like, yeah, I just don't fucking care. <laughs> Anything, you know, there's an evolutionary benefit. There's to probably that. an evolutionary right, benefit yeah. to that. You're probably the person that they're like, Hey, we need some people killed in the neighboring <laughs> camp. Why don't you go? Yeah. 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 And interestingly, a a bunch of SEAL buddies that I know, team guys, like they are similar in this polymorphism. It's just like, yeah, you're totally. That's probably probably right on the head then. You're right. We need a super objective person in our our group here in order to keep us surviving, right? I'll be the nice guy. You be the objective guy. Right. It's like, hey, she's too old. She might need to go. Right. (laughs) Ice flow. Next. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, and I guess I just throw that out there with some context. Like this was some, to the degree it may be accurate. It was some pretty hard one insight. I'm a biochemist by training. I'm super reductionist. I, I'm 99% atheist and 1% agnostic because who knows, but I haven't seen any proof yet. So I don't have much touchy feely element to me, but over the course of time in trying to help people, I'm kind of like, okay, this reductionist approach isn't really cutting it. Mm-hmm. And like we can, it felt like this mating dance of an exotic bird. It was like, if I just bob my head this way and wiggle my ass, like they're going to get it. It'll be there, you know? And it never was. It always changed. And then one day I asked this person, I'm like, who didn't love you? And they were like, what do you mean? And I'm like, somebody didn't love you. This isn't about the food. This is about something else. And dude, it was, he was a big dude. And um, I thought he was going to kill me. Yeah. Like, I thought oh, I was good. But <laughs> ended up having this huge breakdown. And this was kind of the inside. I'm like, oh, it's really not about the food. Like if, if people are really in this spot where they're like, I need a healthy relationship with food. I'm like, no, you don't. You need to figure out what the other thing is that you have transferred the food. Well, this was, onto. this was the side of Paul check that I really connected with when we were talking with him, because it was about, I'd say it took about 10 years into my training career before that light bulb really went off for me. I mean, I was so, cause you're not taught that way. You go through school and the, your books and everything you read, it's all about the science and the math. Like that's what it's, you know, it's numbers. It's like, Oh, you're not mm-hmm. moving enough. Law gotta, thermodynamics. Yeah. Right. That's it. Right. That's, that's it. Right. We Keep speak to there. that all day long. And then I started realizing how much of a psychological component was in the success of my clients. And when I actually started to focus less on that and really dive into that, right. I saw this, I just oh, saw yeah. this uptick in results right. for my clients because to be honest, and we've talked about this on the show before, most people fail. A lot of people fail at this. They had, they come in, oh, this is the goal. I want to look this way or do this. And as a trainer, I was always trying to provide the tools to get there, but they weren't even ready. To, they don't even know how to use the tools yet. Right. You here, know, and so that was the, that's the, was a big breakthrough moment for me. And here's the bottom line: like people think, uh, I need um, I need to work out and I need to eat right so that I'll be happy. What they don't realize is I need to be happy so that when I work out and eat right, everything works out together. Right. It's the happy part. It's that's the part that happens first if you want long term success. You cannot have long term success. Without that, it just doesn't work. And if you and if you don't believe me, look, I've had tons of clients who are super regimented about their fitness and the nutrition, who are unhappy and see and look to it, look to fitness and nutrition to bring them happiness. Mm-hmm. And what they end up doing is they they sign up for marathon after marathon or event after event because that becomes their motivation to keep pushing their bodies. Right. And then when they can't do it because of injury or whatever, because they've overworked their body. They go Everything so goes to the wayside. They go yeah. so far off the wagon, right. That it's it becomes a it's a horrible thing. I I I don't know when I had this insight, but I I 
early on, so I, I was always kind of a power athlete. Like I'm a little fast twitchy and I just kind of like that stuff. And endurance athletes, I just couldn't really make heads or tails out of. But we started doing some work with, with some of these folks. And frequently when I would talk to them, they're like, okay, what, what are your goals? And they're like, I want to do this race faster. And I'm looking at them and they're an orthopedic disaster. Like they're bilateral imbalances and they've got no core, you know, trunk strength. And I'm like, Oh my God, like we, we need to get you fundamentally stronger before you're going to do anything. Like you, they were like a, a energy leak everywhere, yeah, you know? Yeah. So just um, falling forward. Yeah. Just basically falling forward. And so I would tell them something akin to the following. I'd say for you to run faster, we're going to have to cut your training volume by 80% for a period of time. And there would be like stark horror in their eyes. Yes. And what was going on was that all this time outside doing whatever it was they were doing, they were running from their life, literally. Like mm -hmm. if they had a moment alone with their thoughts, they, they would just go oh, nuts. Super terrifying you know? for people, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that was also when I ceased working with endurance athletes, but, um, uh, except under very no rare empathy. circumstances. Yeah, again, the empathy deal. Yeah. We, we yeah. talk about this all the time. Like high level athletes are some of the most imbalanced people I've ever worked in my entire life. Yeah. They're so, some of the hardest to help later in life. There's yeah. some, they are yeah. so good at cheating. What right. I mean by cheating is compensation. Yeah. Their bodies have developed these recruitment patterns that are not favorable, but they're so good at them mm -hmm. that they it succeed. And in order to correct those, those, those recruitment patterns, patterns or change them, you have to regress the hell out of them. And it might even take a year right. of regression. And what athlete is willing to say, you know, to tell them, hey, listen, uh, you know, I know you're... You know, well, you're even if you're not an athlete, if you just have that athletic mindset, because so, yeah. much, so, so many of them were trained that way that, it, you know, it's about intensity. Everyone's Man. intensity yeah. driven. If you just power to your goal, power to your I, goal. I was squatting close to 400 pounds, around 400 pounds, deadlifting in the, close to 600 pounds. I had to regress myself to the point where I was squatting 135 pounds and I was going much deeper ranges of motion, changing the recruitment pattern. My deadlift wouldn't go over 300 pounds because I had to change recruitment patterns. I had to ground my feet and really change things. That was a major ego hit. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to the gym and, and do that when I can lift so much more weight. And it's taken me, I mean, eight months to get somewhere near where I was before. Right. But I had to be willing to do that. There's that huge ego factor right. that people don't even think about. Right. So. Well, I, I deal with that a little bit. Like, I'm really a fan of ketogenic diets. I tend to feel best while in ketosis but I muck around with some old guy Brazilian jiu-jitsu and it's very glycolytic. And there are some people out there that are super smart and they seem to be keto fueling some folks. Like they're doing some tar targeted carbs and stuff like that. But I already get the shit beat out of me at Jets and I'm just not willing. They're like, oh, it might take eight months. It might take a year. And I'm like, and it might not even work as well. As what I'm doing. <laughs> so, so I'm in this middle ground there of, you know, I get like 75, 150 That's grams of carbs a day. So it's lowish carb. But I don't, and I feel pretty good, but I'm not as like cognitively on as when I'm ketotic and everything. So I've been playing with some intermittent fasting and that mm -hmm. seems to pull it in a little bit there. But you know, there's this, all this alluring potential there for doing ketosis, but then I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to have Charlie kick my ass while I'm <laughs> adapting to ketosis. So I mean, that, that ego is a big, mm -hmm. big, oh, yeah. big deal. You know who's, uh, we had big on the time. show, that's an example of that is uh, Zach Bitter. Zach Bitter is somebody. He's an ultra endurance yeah. runner, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like American, I think, world record holder, or yeah. American record holder, I should say, excuse me. Yeah, so he's he does that. He stays in ketosis majority of the time, but then when he gets to these races, he does give little surges of right. it, but it just takes the smallest amount yeah, because he, it's so insulin. He now needs right. a fraction of the carbohydrates he needed to bef before to fuel himself during his mm -hmm. 100. He does 100 mile right. yeah, races, right. and he says his body's so much, so much more efficient right. doing that. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, artificial sweeteners? That's a big area of debate yeah, in our world. Um, I think that they're more of a problem than what most people think and less of a problem than the lunatics think. Mm -hmm. it, uh, Great, so the lunatics will, will say that they're going to like give you cancer tomorrow and they're a huge problem. And I'm kind of like, man, if you drive a car and you're worried about artificial sweeteners, mm -hmm. you have some misplaced yeah, risk in context, analysis. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know? um, but that said, uh, it, in my experience, and also there's some literature that seems to support this, the artificial sweeteners seem to do something squirrely with that appetite. Like people just seem to eat more and like they're not satiated. And, and in that ice cream example, it's interesting where the, the trick is to get people to spontaneously reduce caloric intake, you know, and do it in a way that they feel good. That's and the not holy hungry. grail right there. It's really kind of the holy grail and kind of higher protein, moderate carb diets, lower glycemic load seem to work really well for 
a lot of people, although there's a subset of people that seem to do better on higher carb, lower mm-hmm. fat. So, so there's some distinctions. I'm glad there. you brought that up because there's de- definitely some polymorphisms, you know, in people. And you've got some people that'll do keto, and they're 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 it just doesn't work for them. Their blood right. lipids go crazy and whatever. Then you've got people like me, keto, and I'm like, I feel like God. Money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, you look like it too. It, absolutely. <laughs> I was just gonna say Greek guy, Greek guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Greek Chisel. guy. Just I'm actually, be... I'm actually Italian. I know you. Okay. I know oh, yeah. you're. My wife's Italian. Yeah, yeah. you're, you're yeah. Italian by association. Yeah. 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 That's good. I knew I liked you. Yeah. yeah. He adopted you before he got here. Yeah. Thank so. you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so I've seen situations where people will be motored along pretty well and that, that artificial sweetened thing kind of launches them out. It's kind of the, the, you know, the hookers and cocaine binge after that. Oh and God. so it, it, it's, I use that um, exact example we were talking about. <laughs> I mean, about it happens. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Can't so, blame that's, a, a guy. so that's the challenge that I have with it. And there seems to be some, some uh, literature that uh, indicates that artificial sweeteners may actually alter the gut microbiome in, in unfavorable ways. And so there's some interesting knock on stuff with that. And also when people do artificial sweeteners as a standalone item, so you're sending a signal to the brain from the flavor experience that oh. we're consuming calories. Mm-hmm. But then the hypothalamus is kind of like checking the blood, checking the blood. And it's like, there's nothing. You told me you're sending me something. I'm not getting anything. And so you can decouple that signaling process, I think. And there's a, there's some neurophysiology papers that are kind of suggestive of this. Like I'm, I'm going out on a, a balcony with this deal, but there's some mechanism that, that supports this stuff. But Everything in our biological past, if you had a flavor experience, there was a caloric load associated with that. There was even a nutrient, uh, and there was a nutrient profile, to that. and it was guaranteed. It was baked in the cake. Yeah, literally. if you ate, if yeah. you had a citrusy flavor, you had vitamin C. Right. Every time. Right. Now I could have citrusy flavored, you know, sour gummy bears or whatever. Right. Gummy worms. And, and there's nothing there. It's actually <laughs> extracting <laughs> nutrients out of your body to process the stuff. So. There's, you know, can we create a situation where people are really going crazy on artificial sweeteners and they kind of break the hypothalamic response to real food and then real food doesn't actually cause the satiating mechanism? I can't tell you how many people I've seen in hospital settings that were four to 600 pounds. And it's like, so what do you think got you here? And they're like, it's the soda. And I'm like, was it diet soda? And they're like, yeah, you know, it was a mix, but it was more often than not. They're like, "Ah, I would do the diet soda. And it it did something crazy to them. And, and, you know, this is where the folks that are really into the like calories in calories out deal clearly thermodynamics works, but what's the deeper story here? Like we don't live in a closed system. They're not, this person is not a bomb calorimeter. So Mm. how the fuck did they get 600 pounds and what are we going to do so that they don't cost our society a hundred thousand dollars on the way out? Exactly. And I hate, I'll tell you why I hate that example of the calories in versus calories out. We have examples of changing the microbiome in a mouse. It'll become obese. I could give uh, I could at the give same it, caloric intake. at the same caloric yeah. intake. I could uh, myostatin inhibited animals all the, don't change same calories, tons of muscle. I could take an athlete, change nothing, give them three grams of testosterone a week, which is a shit ton of testosterone. They're going to be leaner and have more muscle. These are there's all these different signaling pathways that can change how your body, you know, your body fat percentage, your muscle, how much muscle you have, and everything that goes underneath that. That has nothing to do. With calories, and I don't think it's crazy to look at the sensation of taste. Like, there's a reason why that signal exists. Right. Like, I'm eating something. Like, why does the why does my brain perceive sweetness to begin with? It's not just to, to it, not just to motivate me to eat more food. There's other things that happen just from having that sensation or from the brain perceiving sweetness and artificial sweeteners do that. It's tricking your brain. Well, Rob touched on that. Like, I mean, it's so funny how like the, the marketing, these huge companies that sell to us, they know that better than some of the damn right. scientists seem to know. Right. That. And, and, and let's also consider this, like you, like you said it earlier, we were not asking the right questions. When the majority of studies done on artificial sweeteners were done, did they look at the microbiome at all? We didn't even know to look at that. Yeah, we, yeah. we had no idea. Yeah. Now we know for a fact that like sucralose, for example, in some studies will kill like up to 50% of the known beneficial bacteria like lactobacillus and bifido, you know, bacteria. It'll kill half of it just by consuming it. Uh, so uh, you know, I'm, I ask you your opinion because I value your opinion. I've heard both sides of it. I know what my opinion is and I may be a little biased, but you Yeah, know. It, it, and again, I, I think that um, – so I had a lot of success early on putting people on low-carb diets. Mm-hmm. But what I had was a bunch of confirmation bias. Mm-hmm. I managed to really ignore 
the people that I broke and dysregulated their thyroid mm. and tanked their CrossFit Games aspirations by running them too low carb, you know, because it worked for me so well. I'm like, man, this has got to work. And there's all these potential mm. like life enhancing benefits. And man, couldn't we like fat fuel Fran, you know, wouldn't that be amazing? And it's like, well, it probably doesn't work, you know, yeah. but I was so confirmation biased with that, that it took a pretty good bludgeoning for me to be awakened to that. And so you have these people that have a methodology and they find a cohort of people for whom it works. And that's fine. But I, I, and you guys talked about this before we started recording. I think it would just be good if people were a little more circumspect about like, hey, this is what I'm doing. And I recognize that it may not work for everybody, mm -hmm. it, but I've got my little niche here and we're doing really good with it. You want to check out what we're up to. Well, you know and I mean? or, yeah. and or look at what is it about that way of eating that it was different than what you're doing. And then maybe it's not so much the, you know, yeah. this name that so they're the calling. change of environment. Yeah. Or, or, or no, we've talked about this before. Like a lot of times you get, you know, people that go vegan, you know, and they oh, become, right. then they become, you know, veganism and it becomes like a religion to them. And it's like, you know, and then they're so anti meat and it's like, oh, it's so bad for you. And they demonize yeah, it. It's, and like, it's like the difference is you ate no vegetables before. Yeah, now you're eating all these vegetables. Of vegetables. Yeah, right. Right. Maybe that's why you feel so awesome. Right. So we talk a right. lot yeah. about, you know, connecting the dots and, and becoming more aware, you know, and it's just, and it is, it's just, we're always evolving. We've been doing this 15, 20 years each and I'm still learning about my body as I, right. as I, you know, but to start to be aware of that instead of mindlessly just putting you, the, you you guys have heard of the Dunning Kruger effect? No, no. You guys haven't heard of that? No. Oh, it's great. Uh, it should be like the the thing that you know is like the logo for this episode. So, it, it's basically um, it's a graph, and it, the graph is knowledge on the uh, x-axis, and then sureness of that knowledge on the y-axis. <laughs> and when you're at zero knowledge, you're at absolute surety, and they call it Mount Stupid. And then <laughs> there's That's this, what I was talking about, inch, inch deep and a mile yeah, wide. Yeah, mile wide. <laughs> but then as you go on, you hit this low ebb where you're into it 10 years, and you're like, I don't, I don't know anything, <laughs> yeah. you know, which is yeah. kind of where like I feel like I'm at now. And then as you get out 15, 20, 30 years, it never reaches Mount Stupid again because you realize you never know all of it. But yeah, Dunning Kruger effect is pretty interesting. You, you end up saying, "Hey, I, I know. I, I, now I now that I know so much, I know." I, I just posted the Socrates code. Yeah, 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 for sure. Do you no. do you think so? Do you think it's kind of a good good rule of thumb then for people to just look at uh, just evolution in general and, and the kinds of foods we were exposed to and. Just as a rule of thumb, like, mm. you know, if they come out with a new synthetic product or flavor or color or whatever, and they say, okay, we have all these studies that show it's safe or whatever, the complexities of how foods and things interact with our body and how our bodies interact with them and the environment, it's so complex and we only know such a small fraction of it. Do you think it's a good rule of thumb to just be like, I'm going to eat kind of around what we've always been eating because that's yeah. probably going to be better. Well, it's been for around me. for thousands of years versus, right. yeah, recent. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, that's my crazy used car salesman pitches eat largely whole unprocessed foods, sleep like a teenager in the middle of the summer and get a decent <laughs> amount of exercise, you know, and have, have community that, that supports you and what you're up to. Like mm. that's, that's my crazy recommendation. You know, I mean, it's super over the top and really nefarious and there's no way to test any, you know, you can test all of that. It's like, just go to bed out, an hour earlier night, put some blue blockers on as soon as the sun goes down, dim the lights in your house and you tell me how lean you are before and after. Take a photo before, go two weeks and, you know, see what happens afterwards. And so you're out 10 bucks buying a pair of blue blocker glasses and you probably enhanced your insulin sensitivity by like 20 to 50 percent, reduced your likelihood of all these chronic degenerative diseases, probably enhanced your uh, anabolic profile, your testosterone's better, and it was a pair of glasses that you wow. swiped off. I'm, go, I'm going to bed on yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've actually done that. I Actually, what I do now is an hour before I go to bed, and I have kids, especially when I have my kids with me, I'll turn the lights off and electronics off, and, go all and we'll use candles. Yeah. We'll use yeah. candles or, or fire, um, because that seems to be a little more natural. And I swear to God, man, I sleep... So and I was never a bad sleeper, so it wasn't like I thought I have to do this because I have a horrible sleep. I just sleep so much better now. My kids, like people, have trouble t taking their kids to bed. They go to bed an hour later when it's time for bed, and they go to bed and they sleep like right away. Yeah, 
And it's that process that we don't realize like that it starts before you go to bed. Right. That sleep process starts way before right. that. So mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean maybe, maybe I am a caveman. Like I just don't have a really complex strategy to this stuff. You know, to eat largely whole unprocessed foods. With a little bit of experimentation, you'll figure out if you have some food sensitivities, mm-hmm. like if you have issues with gluten or not. Again, stick it in, you know, pull it out for 30 days, reintroduce, see how you do. Um, play around with your carbohydrate intake. Start at the low end of things, maybe 50 grams a day, and then run it up to 250 grams a day. And, you know, just kind of play with that. Run it all the way down to 30 or zero for a while and just do like green veggies and ketosis. And with a couple of months of fiddling, you're really going to find a sweet spot for yourself that you don't really need supplements. You don't need anything else. You know, I mean, if you have big aspirations of being like an elite level athlete or, so, you know, like a spec ops guy or something, then we're going to have to get more granular. But those are the big this picture is, deals. This is what we know? talk about also on the show like crazy is that, you know, there's this, this is what I also have a problem with the fitness industry is so much is marketed around the before the workout, the after workout, this pill for this, this powder for that. It's like you got all these people that are eating all this processed shit. They're sleeping terribly. They got all this stress in their life. Six times a day. And, but they're, yeah. in, they're spending $100, $200, $300 a month on all these little pills and powders that are, we're talking about the incremental change from that. Right. It's just, Whereas if they just went to bed an hour earlier or night, like it would blow, <laughs> it would right. be like going on the three grams of testosterone right. a week. It's like, oh, and I just need to sleep. And it's like, yeah, and you'll yeah. keep normal testosterone. Um, <laughs> testicular um, amazing function, when you look so. at you. I have a simple, I know there's got to be a lot of people that will appreciate this question. Brown rice or white rice and why? Uh... <laughs> I, I, I'll leave that up to the gods to decide. I, 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 I'm not really a big rice fan. Um, you know, funny enough, though, my wife and I did just do a bunch of experiments. Like, we're in a continuous glucometer. Wife's Italian. She has great blood blood glucose response. And man, um, white rice, brown rice, purple rice, whatever the rice was, if I had a, a modest helping, which was about 50 grams of effective carbs, I was nearly 200 at, at uh, wow. two hours later. Wow. Like, I was effed up. Wow. And so... Not really much rice for me. Occasionally, yeah. after I do some jujitsu, I might go to Thai food and get some of the like rice paper wrappers or something like that. Where do you but get your carbs from? It. Mainly, man, sweet potatoes, apples, applesauce. Right now, in the summer, I'll get more like watermelon and melons mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Do you squash. do you try to eat uh, seasonally, or do you see there being a benefit to eating seasonally? Like I, kicking up your vitamin D I, in the winter time. I or? do to a degree. Like, mm-hmm. and uh, we. We have a little three-acre farm here, and so we are able to get some stuff out of out of the garden actually year-round now. Like uh, even in the winter, we had uh, squash and um, cabbage. We had some root vegetables, like some Jer- Jerusalem artichokes that mm. just like kind of went wild. But I would literally, I'm like, okay, we're going to have some Jer- Jerusalem artichoke today. I go out and pull the thing up, and it would have these potato-looking things on it, and I'd wash it and cut them up and... And uh, so to a degree, we eat a little bit seasonally. And, and uh, I also just tend to buy what's cheap. And so when things are in season, they, they tend, tend to be, to be cheaper. cheaper. And so I just kind of rotate. Ooh, that's a nice that little fashion. tip there. Yeah. That's yeah. a nice tip. So uh, just, you know, if you don't mind, um, I wanted to get a little, little bit more into just you uh, as an individual, as a person. What motivates you so strongly in this field of study and work? Because you have, mm. I mean, you're obviously, uh, I mean, if you look up paleo, your name comes up. You've got uh, you know a book on the New York Times bestseller. I think you have one that's uh, that's recent. coming out soon. Coming yeah. out soon. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. But why are you so motivated in, in in this particular field? Oh man! So I painted myself as being this like unempathic, like soulless uh, person, and I'm <laughs> I'm gonna like uh, undermine that that uh, mystique. But um, you know, when I first got exposed to all this stuff, it was I had ulcerative colitis so bad that. I was dying, literally. Wow. Like the, the doctors wanted to do a bowel resection on me. I'm a former California state powerlifting champion. I'm not really big, but at 181 pounds, I had a 565 squat, 565 dead, 345 bench. So I'm embarrassed. No wonder he didn't bench, blink when you said your numbers. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, you've been working out for a couple he has longer. Like, he has longer like, limbs yeah, than yeah. I do. He has longer <laughs> limbs than I do. That's a good so, excuse. So I, I was decently kind of fast twitchy. I was reasonably lean, reasonably muscular, although... My doughy Northern European ancestry, like I was always kind of chubby in the midsection, you know, it was like high carb deal and all that. But I shifted my diet to vegan, which I actually blamed a lot of the problems on veganism. And I think now looking back, um, I also moved to Seattle and I was starting a graduate program and I was waking up before the sun came up, got home before the sun or after the sun went down. 
I'd been doing that for like two years. So stress. It's so with all that. stress maxed out. Like I was like, oh, I can get by on three or four hours a night of sleep. No, you can't. Or if you can, maybe you also need to be eating some animal protein and getting some sun on your skin. You know, I'm still in my 20s. But the long and short of that is that I had ulcerative colitis so bad. I'm like 175 pounds right now. The, at the low ebb of my ulcerative colitis, I was 130 pounds from sure. malabsorption issue. I mean, like... I was dying. I was. I, I would eat four thousand calories, but it would go out the same way it, it mm. went in. Hair was falling out, nails were splitting, and everything. I had multiple nutrient deficiencies, and then this idea of a paleo diet got on my radar, and it's kind of an interesting uh, story how that occurred. But I started fiddling with this, and I mean, it was like someone throwing a lifesaver, a, you know, life preserver to somebody drowning. Like it just saved my life. And I started playing around with this stuff and had the chance to start doing this in a gym setting. A good friend of mine, Dave Warner, who's a former SEAL, um, uh, he's also an engineer. We started working out together. And in 2000, 2001, we found this weird workout online called CrossFit. And we started fiddling with that. And they were into the paleo type diet. I'm like, oh, I'm into this too, you know? So there's this good synergy there. And before we knew it, we had like 20 people that we were working out with that, that we were basically training. And so we reached out to the Glassmans and I wrote them an email. Hey, we really like what you're doing. We want to open a gym, call it CrossFit. What do you think? And they're like, go be a chief. And so this was the four, first CrossFit affiliate gym in the world. And so I started working with a lot of people and I would see folks and I'm like, man, I think you've got autoimmune stuff. Why don't we try doing this? And we would remove the grains and maybe pull out the, the legumes and dairy. And lo and behold, they would get better and their GI problems would get better. And, but this was like two, again, 2000, 2001, um, I would navigate my life and meet people constantly that I'm like, oh man, I know what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. Like, but then it, it's almost like one of these M night Shalaman movies where like you can see the future, you know, that the person's going to walk out the door and they're going to go get in a car accident and you need to do something to stop them. But you also need to do it in a way that you don't look like a crazy person. <laughs> so I had like a good 15 or 20 years of trying to help people but do it in a way where I didn't appear to be a crazy person. You know, you can't just jump in there and like grab them and be like, for the love of God, you have to get off of gluten, you know, yeah. the, this uh, thing that you have. And so, um, you know, I've always just enjoyed helping people and, and have had some success with it. So you get that feedback. But my wife's mother died from rheumatoid arthritis complications mm -hmm. three months before I met my wife. And the interesting thing with that is that the rheumatologist who worked with my wife's mother was the rheumatologist who worked with my mom. And he was the one that discovered that she had celiac disease and intolerance to grains, legumes, and dairy. That's what alerted me to that. But he didn't connect the dots with anybody else. And so uh, my wife's mother died at the age of 50. It was a horrible series of medical you know, uh, uh, missteps that brought her to this situation. And if one person at one point anywhere along that line had been able to intervene and put this idea in front of them, she'd probably still be alive. Like if I went and pulled in my, my Gmail and I just searched rheumatoid arthritis uh, uh, resolved or, you know, something like that, just in my own email, I probably have like six or 700 testimonials, wow. which that's six or 700 anecdotes other than wow. the fact that most of them have accompanying blood work, you know? Mm -hmm. So at some point it's like anecdote kind of matters and this circles back to Terry Walls and we're starting mm -hmm. to study this stuff. But, you know, anytime that I kind of get beaten down a little bit, I just think about my wife's mother and the thousands of people that I've met. And, you know, I'd, I just did a, an event in Portland and this gal showed me a picture of herself from a year before she was wheelchair bound from multiple sclerosis. And now she's like up running around doing a, a some sort of a fitness practice. And she's like, I followed your book and the multiple sclerosis went into remission and I've got my life back and wow. I thought I was going to die. So I kind of, you know, I mean, it, when I feel like there's a critical mass of this stuff, then I'm going to, you'll go to, if you go to my website, there'll be a gone fishing sign and I'll be in Nicaragua, like farming coconuts. But until then, I just kind of feel like it, it would be morally reprehensible for me knowing what I know to not at least put it out there so that people have an option. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not to say, like, I really try to avoid the religious dogma around this stuff, but if somebody's really sick, I just want them to know that you might have an option. Like, uh, the, the standard of care might not be the totality of what you, you have available. Do you mm. think uh, getting ulcerative colitis was kind of a gift then in that sense? It definitely was. It would have never pushed me along this, this track, you know. And this is one of the interesting things of the, the wolverines among us, you know, they never have that that crisis. They never have that point where they hit the brick wall and they think they can do anything. 
And they oftentimes don't have a lot of sensitivity to the fact that there are people that are really, really, really broken. Um, there are a lot of people in the fitness and nutrition scene that they will trot out like, oh, I worked with this professional athlete or whatever. And it's like, okay, that's cool. You helped an adult play a child sport and make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Good for you. That's <laughs> awesome. You know, and it, it's like, uh, I, 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 re I say this with the utmost um, honor, but I've been on the Naval Special Warfare Resiliency Committee for seven years. So I go speak to the SEAL teams and special boat teams about sleep and nutrition and stimulants like caffeine and nicotine. And I'm not particularly good looking. And these guys could get anybody that they want to come come do it. And they keep inviting me back. So the only thing I can assume from that is they're getting some value out of what I'm offering to them. And so, you know, like our police, military, and fire, it's a huge honor to work with those people. And I want to help them any way that I can. People who have chronic degenerative disease that they think they have no other options. I want to work with those people. And so as as cool as like the elite athlete is or the real jacked, you know, fitness competitor, that stuff's awesome. But for me, it's just, it, it doesn't light the fire. You mm -hmm. know, when you, mm -hmm. you've got someone whose kid had, a, a, you know, unresolvable epileptic seizures and you hook them up with the Charlie Foundation and they get put on a, a well-managed ketogenic diet and the kid is completely normal and, and killing it in school, you're like, fuck yeah, that yeah. was awesome. Well, in, yeah. Enhancing a life Very is one rewarding. thing. Changing or saving a life is another. You know? Right. I mean, that's right. totally. Right. So can you, we're, we're getting ready to go to uh, pay the OFX for the first time ever. Nice. Uh, nice. Can you give us a little bit of history on it and the rundown and what to expect oh, for us? Like we've never been there before. I don't, I'll, we got it. Uh, we heard from Ben Greenfield the very first time, did a little bit of research on it, but don't know much. I'm sure obviously you're well. Oh man, it's the paleo <laughs> nerd fest. I'm not sure what to say <laughs> beyond that. You know, it's, Do we um, have to have like special hats or shirts or anything? <laughs> they really frown on that the, the oh. more nude you are kind of oh, the I better see, with I see. the whole okay. caveman oh, we'll fit right in so there. yeah i'll yeah. be sure and shave perfect yeah. perfect yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um it, it's a great time they hold it each year in austin usually in the spring or the early summer um super hot chicks there not not quite to the density of like a crossfit games event but uh <laughs> really pretty good great we uh, all have girlfriends uh, and wives uh, okay. you just <laughs> ruined it details. for us well i'm taking hey, my, my wife, wife. Doesn't <laughs> listen. i'm bringing a pail of sand to the beach so i'm i have one up you guys on that one um but it, really wonderful people. So usually some great presentations, uh, although it's not an academic meeting. Like there are some good academicians there. Uh, David Perlmutter, I think, is doing the keynote. Oh, and like, he love him. crushed the keynote last love year. Love him. It was really amazing. Brainmaker, one of my favorite yeah. books. Yeah. And he, he's, uh, he's pretty jacked. Like when you see him, he, he's not super tall, but like thick neck and thick traps and everything. Like he definitely knows his way around a barbell. So I, I really dig that guy. But um what else about Paleo FX? Really good food. I mean, Austin has great food, but they always have great food at the event. And then last year, I roped them into having a huge section in the middle of the event uh, matted with jujitsu mats. And we had a big jujitsu thing out no there. Way. So I, like in between every one of my presentations, I would basically run out roll until it was like two minutes before my presentation then i would go up there and like great. my shirt was stuck to me i had <laughs> like shoveled. blood dripping in my eye and everything and like where have you been <laughs> oh nothing you know? oh, that's so, awesome so like there will bears. be jujitsu ju ju there dude again. you're yeah. speaking my language i trained i trained for a while years back for about six years and nice it's one of my favorite sports definitely the thinking man's martial art i know yeah. it's going to piss off a lot of people who do other arts but i'm a little biased rob do you meditate I do, but I use a meditation app called Brainwave. Okay, and cool. I, I just find that I'm too squirrely, too high. So jujitsu is my meditation. That's why I like, asked you because yeah, people yeah. like you who tend to be so driven yeah. and who, you know, admittedly you drove yourself to illness because you were so focused right. on what you were doing. Um, that's why I asked if you, if you meditate or have yeah. you identified that being an area you it, need to. It's a huge area of improvement for me. And like if I'm tracking HRV and I do that five minutes of, of breathing even mm -hmm. once a day, like that HRV score Crazy, improves right? immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How about a, a exploration with things like ayahuasca or psychedelics to exp expand that side of you, that empathetic or non-empathetic side that. You don't get a chemistry degree at Chico State University wanting to make a lot of money. <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> so, it'll be my oblique answer. <laughs> answer to that um <laughs> so uh, so Wait, we just become best friends <laughs> best thing i've ever heard I know. so, so uh, I, what a great pc way to put that yeah. out so so i i uh funny and true story i uh when i was doing my undergrad i wanted to do an extraction out of a san pedro cactus which contains mescaline and, and um so i went to my my professor and i'm like hey i'm wanting to do a natural products extraction and then actually a synthesis so that we get 
you know, validation of the natural product. It, it's a very normal thing. Like you do a synthesis mm -hmm. starting with like gallic acid and then you, you converge on this thing. He's like, what are you thinking about? And I was like, three, four, five trimethoxyphenylethylamine, you know, just kind of like totally like <laughs> off the, off the thing. And he's like, what type of methodology you using? And I showed him and he's like, I can save you 15 steps. And he reaches in his file drawer, pulls it out and hands it to me. I'm like, oh, this is why you're a professor at Chico State University. <laughs> so so I, uh, in the San Pedro cactus that I used, I actually got a trimming off of it from the dude that used to run the botany scene there. So I got this mescaline containing cactus and extracted it and, you know, did the full natural products extraction deal and then did a, a synthesis using a gallic acid backbone and this was all funded by the uh, chemistry alumni reunion yes. symposium uh, <laughs> summer wow. summer internship wow. deal yeah yeah that's great that's fucking rad <laughs> yeah, that's really so good. rad well hey man it's been excellent talking to you yeah. great yeah. hanging out with you yeah. Yeah. Thank you. hopefully yeah. for sure we run into you at uh, paleo F it, oh you know on that note real quick before we sign off uh because we will probably be interviewing and talking to people are there anybody we should make sure we talk to that maybe we haven't met or talked to before oh man tons of people i know that's um, i know there's gonna be a lot somebody you're like you know if you get a hold of this guy, yeah. don't miss definitely, grab onto this person. Definitely Mark Sisson, and not just because he's like a big wig in the scene, but Mark's just like a super accomplished in so many areas of his life and a really awesome dude. Like mm. great at business, amazing relationship with his kids. He's still married to the same person, you know. What I mean, it's like he's kind of kind of yeah. cool dude. Uh, you guys already know Ben Greenfield. Um, Chris Cresser is a re he, I would argue possibly the best clinician in this like ancestral health evolutionary medicine kind of interface like he okay. is a brilliant guy like i i feel like an idiot next to that guy right, like well, I'll, I'll feel a little well, hoity-toity and then i hang out with him and i'm like we'll feel like I, the r word i don't know <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. the r finishing with a d and then um <laughs> Chris, rad. Chris, rad, yeah. yeah we we'll feel real yeah, rad. We'll feel rad. Yeah. Um, chris master john if, if he's there like that guy uh, like if you want to get, he's so well versed in so many things, but if you really want to go down the rabbit hole of fat soluble vitamins and their implications on health, oh, like yeah. vitamin ADK, the interface between those and zinc and testosterone production, dude, he like, I feel like I have a decent steeping in that, but I, I, I am pressed to keep up with him and that's just on his podcast material, which oh, I know right. he waters down for the general consumption wow. a little bit. So definitely uh, Chris master, John. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks Perfect. for my pleasure. Coming yeah. on. Think great. L listen, if you like mind pump, go to mindpumpmedia.com, enroll in our free 30 days of coaching. Every day you're going to get an email with a new subject and links to episodes where we talk about that subject in detail. Also, you can find us on Instagram at mind pump radio. You can find me at mind pump Sal. Justin's at Mind Pump Justin, and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>